We are going to build a full game from scratch. This is a culmination of all my experience over the last five years. I'm going to streamline this process for you. If you stick with me in this video, you will be proud of what you have created. Here is our overview. We are going to build a 3D environment and characters in a program called Blender. We will then use GIMP, General Image Manipulation Program, to texture this environment and our models. We will then export this environment plus models to our game engine called Godot. Here we will build and code our game. It will be a slimmed down version of Nazi zombies. Our enemies will chase us down and we the player will shoot at them and get points, FPS style. It sounds like a lot, but I promise you this is the fastest way to learn what I have learned in five years. I'm condensing all my knowledge down to get you in the game as quick as possible and avoid the frustration that plagued me. Sometimes you don't even really know what questions to ask, so you don't know how to advance forward. I'm going to clear all that up and just get you moving as fast as possible. First, let's talk about what we need. We need a program to create the game called the Game Engine. This is pretty standard practice. Dark Souls uses the Havoc Engine, Gears of War uses the Unreal Engine, and Fallout uses the Creation Engine. So why don't we use something like these? Well, because Unreal is expensive to publish for indie games and others are proprietary to their companies, they won't just let you use them. So, in terms of free game development right now, Godot is at the top of my list. We can get the download from godotengine.org slash download slash windows. I'll leave a link in the description so you know where to go. <laughs> download the regular release and, dot, and not the .NET version. The .NET version is for c -sharp users, which we are not. Next, we are going to download Blender. I'll again leave a link in the description. Blender is a 3D modeling software we can use to create 3D objects for our game world and animate them. So we will animate our characters using Blender and create our game world too. Completely free, you can download it from blender.org, I'll leave a link. Finally, we need GIMP, which is an image editing program. Images wrap around our 3D objects we create in Blender, and they end up in the game world as our textures. We can create cool images to use within GIMP to make our game look interesting. Those are all the downloads we need, they're all completely free, and now we can get creating. Here's how the process is going to go. We're going to make all of our 3D objects first in Blender. We'll get the texture straight in GIMP. And then after all that is done, we'll export everything to Godot and get our game coded. All right, so you might be opening Blender for the first time, but that's okay, because I'm going to teach you how to use Blender step by step by introducing you to individual elements that build into each other. First, we are going to open up Blender. You will probably get some setup dialog to select the language and stuff. After that, you can go to the default scene option, which gives us a new basic scene. So this is what Blender normally looks like with a default scene. A cube in the middle, a light to the left, and a camera to the right. If you are completely new to Blender, you might find it hard to understand what you are looking at. For now, do not worry about the panels to the right side of the screen. We will address them later. We want to focus on the main part of the screen with the cube. The fundamental controls of Blender are this. Mouse scroll to zoom in and out middle mouse click to rotate around the center of the screen, shift plus middle mouse click to drag the screen to that direction. Clicking on the gizmo at the top right of the screen will flip your view to that orientation. These are the simplest ways to move your view in Blender. If you want to see all the keyboard shortcuts for Blender, you can view them here. There's a link in the description. However, we will learn more shortly. Selecting an object. To select an object, we need to click on it and or drag a selection box over it. You can select multiple objects at once by holding shift, but for now, just select the cube. When the cube has an orange outline, it is ready to manipulate. Pressing G will allow you to move the cube freely. Pressing escape will cancel that movement. If you press G and then press X, Y, or Z, then you will move only on that axis. If you press G, then hold shift and press the X, Y, or Z keys, you will lock that axis and the cube will only move in the other two. So if you only want to move the cube left or right, or forward or back, and not change its height, you should select the cube, press G, and then Shift Z so that the cube will not change in elevation, but will move along the ground. The S key operates the same way as the G key. We can use it the same way, but it will scale instead of move. Rotation can be achieved by doing the same thing with the R key. We can rotate on any axis or by locking the axis like we have done previously with the other settings. So, we can now move, rotate, and scale the cube any way we want. Let's do all three in a random fashion so the cube is in a different spot from where it was. Any which way as long as it's different from where it was. 
Now you will notice if you press the S, the G, or the R key, and then select the axis using Z, X, or Y, you can tap the axis again to move along the local axis of the cube as opposed to the X axis of the world. This works for scaling movement and rotation as well. It can be useful to get things into position, so you want to keep that in mind. I only point this out because it confused me at first. I didn't understand what was happening. So, if we don't like our cube's location, rotation, or scale anymore, we can return them back to normal by pressing Alt-G for location, Alt-R for rotation, and Alt-S for scale. This will return the object back to its applied location, rotation, or scale. On the flip side, if we did like these placements, how could we keep them? Well, we need to apply that specific property. We do this by pressing Control A while having the cube selected. This will bring up a menu where we can decide what we want to apply. Once applied, the cube will return to that spot when Alt-G is pressed. The same goes for applied rotation or scaling. They will become the object's default when applied. To give you an overview, this is how Blender works. You create objects like the cube you see in the middle. Then you can edit those objects in different ways to create new shapes. Simple shapes like cubes or advanced shapes like dragons. We refer to these shapes as meshes. A mesh is made up of faces, and the faces are made up of points called vertices. In the simplest terms, the computer knows which way the vertices are facing and where they are. So it connects them and creates faces that make up the whole of the mesh. The more vertices the mesh has, the longer the computer is going to need to process it. Hundreds of thousands of vertices can be used in a game, but generally it is best to use the fewest amount possible to achieve the look you want for your game. Having less stuff to display cuts down on the work your computer has to do to output all those graphics. Lighting in Viewport Shading So we understand the cube mesh a little better, but now let's take a look at the other objects. First, let's examine the light to the right of the cube. You will notice that there really isn't any light coming from it. This isn't because the light isn't working, it is because the display mode we are in. To see the light, we need to press and hold the Z key and move our mouse to select the different viewing modes. We are currently in the solid view and we want to switch to the top one, the render view. So, move your mouse up and release the Z key to select that view. After releasing, try selecting the light again and moving it around with the G key. The cube should project shadows now and the light should be visible. We can switch freely between the views by pressing the Z hold or by using the buttons at the top right of the screen. Often when manipulating or editing models, it is common to switch viewport shading frequently to get a more cohesive view of the scene. Continuing with the light, switch to the render viewport shading, Z hold and mouse up, select the light and look to the right to see the panel and that holds all of the object's properties. With the light selected, click the green icon on those panels that looks like a light bulb. If you hover over it, it says Data Object, Data Properties. Click on this to be able to adjust the light's properties. The main properties to play with here are the power, which makes it brighter, the color, which changes its color, and the type of light selected by the icon. You can choose the light and play around with the different options. I will keep mine on point for now and leave the settings about the same. It is not super important for our purposes. Let's talk about the object property panel a little more. On the set of icons where we selected the green light bulb icon, there is more to see and understand. These are added options for whatever selected object we have. Click on the orange square inside of the box. When hovered, it says object, object properties. Click on the orange box to the panel and the panel to the right will change so that you can see the transform of the selected object. The transform is the position, rotation, and scaling of that object. You can change the values here to manipulate the object the same way we did earlier using the G, S, and R keys. The panel is good to understand, but we will not have to adjust anything here for now. The icons above the orange box on the same strip are not properties of the selected object. Instead, they are properties of Blender or the entire screen or the world. We will go into depth on them later and when we need to use them. Editing the cube. We are now going to edit the cube, so we start by selecting the cube. Then we press the tab button once. This will enter us into edit mode. We can press the tab button again to return to object mode. We can also change the modes by selecting them from a drop down at the top left. The modes you can change will differ depending on the object you have chosen. A light will have no edit mode, but a mesh should always have an edit mode for instance. 
In edit mode, we can manipulate the mesh that makes up the shape of our object. If we look at the top left, we will see some icons that represent the vertices, the edges, and the faces of our mesh. Select the edges, the middle option, and you will see we can manipulate the edges of the cube. You can select a single edge by clicking on it individually and holding shift to select multiple edges. With the edges selected, we can use our trusty G, S, and R keys to move, rotate, or scale just like we did in object mode. If we return to our top left menu and select the face icon, the rightmost one that looks like a square, we will be able to select the faces of the cube. The same rotation, scaling, and location methods are available to us here by using our G, S, and R keys again. We will examine the last option on the menu to the top left, the vertex selection. Here we can move the verts that make up the edges, giving us very fine control of the shape, again using G, S, and R keys. While still in edit mode, we can look to our left and view the tools available to us while editing our mesh. T will hide and show our editing toolbar. From the top down, I will be explaining the tools. The select box, this will allow us to choose our method of selection. We default to box selection, but we can change things to make it more conveniently. We might use this later on. The cursor, the cursor is basically where your viewport is looking at regularly. Don't mess with this for now, just leave it where it is. The next four options are just the moving, scaling, and rotation buttons that we used earlier with the G, S, and R keys. It's just another way to access them. Further down, we have annotations, which just allow you to annotate the creation uh, you have made. I have never used this feature. The measure tool is below that, and it does exactly what it says. It measures stuff. I really don't use it much, but it can be helpful. Add cube. This will allow you to add another cube to the mesh, and that cube can be manipulated after creation as well. Extrude region. This one is very useful. You can use it to continue a shape or extrude it. It adds more geometry to our mesh. We can extrude a single vert, an edge, or a face. Inset region. This will create more geometry on the mesh by creating a shape inside from the outer edges. Bevel. Bevel will bevel the edges or round them depending on the setting of the bevel. Loop cut. Loop cut will create a loop all the way around the mesh, can be very useful for modeling. The knife tool is the last one we will talk about, and that allows you to cut vertices into a shape. It's very situational, but pretty useful. The other tools are not really going to be used in this tutorial, and they're more advanced, so we're not trying to master Blender here, we're just trying to learn enough to make games. The first thing we're going to be making is a torch to light up our scene in the game. To begin, we just want to go ahead and switch back to object mode. After that, we will select the cube and press X to delete it. We are then going to create whatever shape we want. At the top left, near the mode selection, there is an add button. When clicked, we move to the mesh option and follow the drop down, press the plane to create a new plane mesh. Now that we have our plane mesh, we want to edit it. So let's switch to edit mode. Let's use the menu on the top left again, select the face selection. Now select the top face of the plane and press E to extrude the plane's face up a short distance. This will be the base of our torch. Pressing E here is the same as selecting the extrude tool on the left side of the toolbar. This is just much faster. Notice when we pressed E, we were automatically locked onto the local Z axis of the mesh. To move the extrusion freely, press the Z key and that will unbind it from the Z axis, allowing it to move everywhere. However, this locking is what we want, so there's no need to worry about it for now. Let's extrude again and we should have a taller cube shape. After clicking to finalize the second extrude with the same face selected, Press the S key to scale the top face inward, creating a nice slant shape. We will repeat this process to create the elongated skinny section, leading to the torch tip. We can flare it out at the top to make the holder for the embers. To create the cup shape at the top, we can select the top face of the torch and press I to create an inset. Drag the mouse to choose where the inset stops. Click on the inside squares and press the E key to extrude the square downward, creating the torch cup. Using the I for inset here is the same as using the inset option on the toolbar. Our torch modeling is now complete, however we want to add a material and a texture to the torch to make it look cool. So in Blender we have materials which are found on the tab that looks like a beach ball in the object properties panel. 
With our torch selected, we can click the Material tab to view the materials in use on that object. Currently, there are no materials on that mesh, so we need to create one. Press the New button on the Material panel. A new material will be created, and you can double-click the material to rename it. I will name this material Concrete. If we scroll down the Materials panel, we can see the attributes that make up the material. Let's change the base color by clicking on the color selector next to the base color attribute. If you are changing the color and the object is not changing colors, you may be in the solid shading preview. Use the Z button to switch to the material preview view like we did before. You should see the color change now. We want to have two different materials on this torch, so let's click the small plus sign near the top right of the panel. This will create another new material that we can name by double-clicking on it, just like before. Now that we have the material created, it is important to assign it, otherwise it won't actually appear on our model. To do this, we want to go to Edit Mode and choose the Face Selection option. We will then select the faces we want to apply or assign the material to. We can select multiple faces in a loop by using the Alt key. Select the faces vertically, click towards the uppermost or lowermost section of the face while holding the Alt key. To select horizontally looping faces, select click to the left or the rightmost section of the face while holding Alt. When you have the face you want selected, return your cursor to the Material tab, make sure you have the correct material selected, and click the Assign button. The new material should now be assigned to the selected faces. Now we have materials and we need to give those materials textures. A texture is just an image. This image will wrap around the shape and give the object its intended look in the game world. If you want free textures, you can go to Texture Haven or OpenGameArt.org. We will be creating textures for this game in GIMP because it is good practice. Let's put Blender on hold and jump into GIMP. When we first open up GIMP, we can see we have an empty screen with a mascot peeking from the bottom. We need to navigate to the File option at the top left of the screen, select New, and then Create a New Image dialog will pop up, and we will set the parameters of the new image we are creating. Let's do a square texture that is 500 by 500 pixels. Before you click OK, click the Advanced Option Plus button and navigate to the Fill With dropdown. From the dropdown, select the Foreground Color option, now before accepting, choose the foreground color near the top right. Darker colors work better for what we are attempting. I will use black. Once the color is selected, click OK in the dialog and create the new image. Now that we have a blank canvas, we will grab the paintbrush tool, choose a color, and paint a bit. I like to dab a bit instead of dragging that seems to produce the results I want. I will use contrasting colors, select one of the cloudy paint stamps. I will place a few in random areas around the square. I like to choose a few different brushes and maybe rotate them a little bit as well for added effect. I will repeat this with a different color, probably a lighter one to add a little more contrast. Once done, I will select the colorize option from the color menu at the top. This will allow me to recolor everything to a more muted concrete tone. I then like to play around with the exposure until I get something I like, normally upping the black level and the exposure. After this, we need to go to the Filters dropdown, hover over the Maps option, and select the Tile Seamless option. We now have a seamless, tileable texture. We will now export this to a folder for use in Blender. It is important to note that saving a project in GIMP does not export the image that we need. If you save the GIMP file, it allows you to open that file in GIMP again. To get our PNG, we need to export the picture. Saving is still recommended, however. To export a picture, select the File option at the top left of the screen, then click the Export As option. Change the name of the image to the file type you want. I want to use PNGs. Let's choose that and click on the Export, which gives us our texture that we need. Before we leave GIMP, let's create a normal map texture that will help Blender add more definition to our 3D object. With the GIMP project still open, select the Filters option at the top again, hover over the Generic option, and select Normal Map, which will turn our image blue with what looks like red veins running through it. This is our normal map, and it will help us create more definition on our 3D object. We will export this image and jump back into Blender, the Shader Editor tab, and adding our images. Now that we have our texture, it's time to place those textures on the materials inside of Blender. 
Let's choose our concrete material first. We need to switch to the Shader Editor tab. We do this by clicking on the tab at the top of the screen. We won't use all of these tabs, but we will view more later. The importance of the Shader Editor tab is to easily adjust your materials. In Blender, materials can use a node-based system that we see on the bottom half of the screen. If you haven't done so yet, you can try clicking on the outer edges of panels to drag them bigger or smaller. Nodes sound complicated, but they are just attributes we attach to our material. What we are seeing are the same properties that we have on our material panel to the right, but with nodes. In this view, we also have added functionality for the material, like adding image nodes. That is what we are going to do now. Let's click the Add button at the top of the node panel. This will result in a drop-down menu where we select the Texture submenu and then the Image Texture option. This will create for us an Image Texture node with which we can load our image we created earlier in GIMP. Click the Open button on the Image Texture node and select the texture you want to place on that material. Your image will most likely look stretched and warped on the shape. Don't worry, we are about to fix this. UV editing and what are UVs? There is nothing wrong with our texture. Instead, it is the UV map of the object that has problems. If you don't know what a UV map is, don't worry, we are going to learn now. Let's change our tab again to the UV editing at the very top. We can see our image to the left and our object to the right. Our object might be in solid shading. So let's hover over the side of our screen and use the Z key to select the material preview shading. Okay, now we can explain what is going on here and what are UVs. UVs are the mapping of your texture onto the 3D object. Here are a few examples I found online to illustrate the principle. We are taking the texture that is a 2D image and telling Blender how to lay the image on top of the 3D mesh. This is called a UV map. So why is our UV map all messed up? Because our scaling is non-uniform on the object. We scaled certain faces of our mesh when we were creating it, and it means the UVs are confused on how they should lay. We can see this if we click on the top faces of the torch. The flat shape of the UV to our left resembles the face on our model to our right. If we now click down on the squarish section where we scaled and extruded, you can see the UVs do not resemble the shape at all. All these issues have a simple fix. Simply return to object mode. Make sure the torch is selected and hit Control A to access the Apply menu. Now we can apply all the transforms which will fix our scaling issues. So our model is not fixed just yet. Our scaling is now corrected and we need to tell Blender to remap the UVs on the object. This is called unwrapping the object. Let's prepare to unwrap our object now by switching to editing mode. So we need to add seams to our model to tell Blender how to unwrap it properly. A seam is where the model will have separation on the UVs. It is easier to show you than to explain. We want to select the side edges of the mesh and then mark them as seams. We can switch to edge selection at the top left and then select the edges we want. These are lines our UVs will separate at when unwrapping. Just stick with me and it'll make sense. We want to select the outer edges of the model. To do so, we use a combination of the shift key select multiple edges, and the Alt key to select entire loops. This can be more complicated on a complex model, and we will show an automatic way to do this, but having a moderate understanding of UVs is important for a game developer. Once we have them selected, let's mark them by right-clicking on them and selecting Mark Seam. The lines now have an orange highlight to them, denoting them as seams. Now we have added seams to the model, we can finally unwrap it. In edit mode, we can press A to select all the geometry on the model. This should highlight the entire torch. We now need to access the UV options and the editing viewport ribbon. If your screen is concealing the options like mine is, click the ribbon with the middle mouse button and drag it to the left. We are looking for the UV button. Click it and then select the option unwrap at the very top of the dropdown. Your model's textures should now look a little better on the model. You can click on the faces of the model to edit them individually. I am okay with this for now. Let's add our normal texture to our material and be done with it. But before we do that, I want to demonstrate the automatic way I alluded to earlier. 
we can basically ask Blender to project the seams onto our object by going to the UV button again in the editing menu and choosing the smart UV projection. Make sure you have the entire model selected or it won't know what you want to project. It attempts to unwrap your shape by creating its own imaginary seams. This works pretty well for simple geometry. Adding the normal texture. So this is the same as when we added the image texture a few minutes ago. First, we will go back to the shading tab at the very top of the screen. Next, we will click the add button in the node menu. Select the texture submenu and then select the image texture option. This creates the image texture node so we can select our normal texture. Go ahead and do this now. Now, we cannot just plug this node into the material directly. We need a helper node in between to interpret the data correctly. So we click the add button again, and this time click on the search option. Type normal map and then select that option. We then plug the normal texture into this node and the output of the normal map node goes to the material in the normal slot. This gives our material an understanding of how light should be applied to the object. We will not add any other maps to the material if it is not needed. I'm trying to introduce everyone to the ideas at a lightning pace without being too boring. Adding more images or maps to the material will make it look better by adding more definition. We're not trying to make the next Skyrim here, so we're only going to add these two maps and we're going to leave it where it is. Next, we will be finishing our second material, which will take much less effort. This is going to be a golden metallic type deal, so let's just apply the same normal map as our first material, but use a golden color. You'll see what I mean in a second. First, we want to select the second material on our mesh. Once we have it selected, let's look at the options we have. The color is easy to adjust. Let's make it a yellowish brown. Next, we are going to take the metallic value and set it all the way to one because this is a metal object. We can now adjust the roughness of the object, which will change how smooth the object looks. You can put a height map in here instead of adjusting this attribute, which would make the material look better. However, it is beyond the scope of what we want so let's just move it until we get something we like. Now, let's add the normal texture. Let's return to our first material, concrete. Now we should box select the normal map and the image node containing the normal map image. Once, once you have it selected on your keyboard, press Control C to copy those nodes. Now click back to your second material again to return to it. You can click inside the node selection now and press Control V to paste those nodes. You can then hook them up and our normal map is ready to go. So now we have a rough overview of how Blender modeling goes. Let's expand our knowledge a little further. So we can now create and modify shapes within Blender. We can add textures to those shapes as well. So the basic idea is that we make shapes look like things and then we put textures on them to make those things look more like things. And that's basically how it goes. Uh, the final pillar of simple modeling with Blender is the use of modifiers. We're going to create a new scene and then take a look at modifiers. We are just going to use the default cube and add some modifiers to see how they work. To access the modifiers, you must have a mesh selected and click the tab that looks like a wrench. Then choose the Add Modifier dropdown and choose from the list. There is a long selection, but I will only ever use a few of them. We will only cover the few basic ones that are needed for our game dev journey. Let's go ahead and select the mirror modifier. The mirror does exactly what you think it will, mirror the shape to the selected axis. We split the cube using the loop cut tool and delete the vertices so the mirror does all the work for us. This can cut in half the work that we have to do when modeling. When I have symmetrical objects, it is much easier to only model half or even just a quarter of the full shape. If you are using the mirror modifier in this way, it is important to take note of the clipping and merging options. The clipping feature will merge the mirror vertices with the actual geometry, making your model watertight so there won't be cracks between the faces. The clipping checkbox enables the feature. The merge value is the distance between two vertices before they become one. 
For our purposes, we only have to turn on the feature and not adjust any of the other values. I don't think I've ever had to adjust this value, it's pretty small already. We can also mirror the entire object around another object. To demonstrate, let's add a cube first and drag it to the left with the G key. Also, we add another mirror modifier to our star shape, and this time we will place the cube into the mirror object slot. Alternatively, you could select the shape with the eyedropper. The star shape should now be mirrored over the cube in the axis we chose. We can show or hide the modifiers in each specific mode by clicking on the icons near the top of the modifier panel. Let's remove the secondary mirror modifier for now to make the example simpler. Finally, we can click the drop down on the modifier panel to select the apply option. Applying will make the mirror modifier into real mesh in the viewport. You will notice we can no longer edit the mirror modifier options. Applying the modifier removes it from the stack, meaning it is no longer editable. The geometry is now created at this point. We can still control Z to undo if this was an accident. Generally, if you don't need to apply a modifier yet, or you are not finished with the object, it is best not to apply the modifier. Before we export, we will need to apply all modifiers because they will not transfer to the game engine or any other program. These modifiers are specific to the Blender program. Subdivision Surface Modifier. We will look at another modifier for more reference. This one is called the Subdivision Surface Modifier, which sounds very complicated, but it just increases the amount of geometry on your mesh. We will apply it to our star shape to understand what it does. We can have multiple modifiers going on at the same time and even change the order as needed. After adding the Subdivision Surface Modifier, we can see the surface of the model has been subdivided into more chunks. The edges become rounder because the mesh is now interpolating or estimating the middle of the divided surfaces. We can change this by altering the mode of the modifier to simple instead of catmull clark. In simple mode, our shape will still be divided, but the edges will not be rounded like before. We can change the amount of subdivisions by changing the value in the level's viewport. We could also apply this in the same way we applied the mirror modifier. There are lots of modifiers we could use, but those are the two I use most often. If you are new, it's best to experiment around and see what other modifiers do. For now, we have what we need to start modeling, so let's begin our level construction. Making the temple. So now we are going to create our game world. We are going to do a zombies clone, so we need an arena type deal. I'm going to show my planning technique, and then I'll show sped up footage of me creating the map in Blender. I may highlight some areas in the process just to demonstrate how to accomplish certain things. You can create your own map using the modeling techniques we've shown so far. All right, so we're making the map now. Uh, you can skip past this part if you want. This is just kind of um, to show you how I did it. And here it was kind of stupid to model both sides because I end up just cutting it in half and using a mirror modifier. So, I mean, that's usually my go-to. I don't know why I didn't do it from the start here. Um, it's not a very big map, but I wanted to give a couple challenges for the pathfinding for Godot. I wanted to have some hallways, which I do, and then I also wanted to have the bridges. And I think what I'm going to do is just make a flat mesh to go on top of everything. And um, uh, it'll make more sense when I do it, but I'm going to have that be what the character collides with. And then all the other meshes are just going to be there just for show, and we'll have the um, collision mesh be separate. I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> so I'm getting pretty close to, oh, I'm doing some planks right here, putting them in an array, and then 
I'm just gonna have these floating steps that are like uh, purple stone shit or whatever. It's gonna be like a space type thing with some type of um, liquid flowing underneath it is what I'm going for. You put the camera into view and I think it's always good to get a viewpoint on your level uh, with your camera and then you can hit O to return to it so it's always you know you can press O and get that vantage point. So here I kept fucking with the geometry for no reason and then I had some textures. Oh yeah, here I started putting all the textures on and I basically just grabbed fill patterns from uh, GIMP and then, you know, changed the color a little bit or edited them. Um, I mean, you could go as crazy as you want with the textures and make your own or have an artist make them or buy them or, you know, however you want to do it. Uh, I'm just doing this the fastest way I know just to demonstrate what like the textures are and shit like that. I don't know, my approach towards graphics is that they should just look good enough to be able to understand what the thing is. And what the thing is, is abstract buildings. So I think that's what it looks like to me. I'm kind of along the PS2 lines of just make it look good enough. I never really gave a shit about HD graphics, but I'm not a little zoomer, so what do I know? Uh, here, um, the scaling on these is all fucked up, so I have to go back and apply the scale, and that makes them look a little better. I do like this ground texture. I think that looks pretty cool. Even though I didn't really make it, I just copied and pasted it. But I really like that. <clears throat> it looks pretty fucking sick. Uh, the goat texture, I don't know why I was trying to put that in there. It looks like shit. Um, I thought maybe it would look cool, but it does not. So I eventually give up, and you can watch that in just a second. I just thought this was a good demonstration of UVs and how you can map them and try and make shit. But... You know, sometimes it's just not worth all the effort. Especially if you're doing an indie game. I mean, why? But yeah, we plugged that shit in right there. Uh, that looks pretty good. And then I added a background texture in the world environment. And that's how that stuff appears in the back on the rendered uh, rendered scene but yeah then I just add this big plane and subdivide it a bunch of times and then we add a uh, displacement modifier with a noise texture so it kind of just kind of noises it all up moves it all around I make some big rocks to put in the background so it's kind of like a almost like a query waterfall and outer space type deal which is what we're doing um, I think it looks pretty decent for the amount of time I put in and I mean, that's not really the point. The point is that you're making a level and you're learning how to use Blender and all that shit. So, honestly, if I was going to make a game, I'd probably have an artist do it because I'm not really, I'm not really an artist. I'm just uh, some fucking uh, guy online. So, yeah, we have our uh, finished product here. Uh, I look pretty much like the way it turned out. It's kind of like, I don't know, kind of like Unreal Tournament-ish. Um, yeah, I might uh, add a little more to it. We're going to add some items, have items on the wall, just like zombies, where you can, like, you know, buy them off the wall and shit. We're going to add that. Uh, I'll probably do, like, a shotgun, a pistol, and, like, an SMG or something. Um, we also might add a little door trim, uh, maybe some baseboard, and then maybe just some, like, space shit up on the walls. That'll probably be cool. And then, uh, of course, once we get to Godot, we're going to have to add all of our own lighting because the lighting from Blender doesn't really carry over, so. But, um, yeah, it's going to be pretty, pretty freaking sweet. I made it kind of circular, and the enemies, I think we're going to uh, go with something close to, like, Stephen King's The Langoliers um, looking because it'll be easy to make in Blender. 
So now that we have our level, I want to create some collision for the character to stand on. We could just use the geometry that is the ground, but I prefer to create a plane just above the ground so we can simplify everything. I just created a plane mesh in Blender and then extruded it to be roughly the shape of the ground. We are now going to export our model and begin building our game in Godot, but before we export, we must create a game to export into. So let's put Blender to the side and open up Godot. Once we are in, we can choose the new project icon at the top right, choose a name for your project, and then click the create and edit button to create a new folder and open the project. We now want to create a new folder for our 3D models to be placed in. You can take whatever approach you want to organizing the files here. I'm going to make an assets folder and then make a folder for the level and characters. It's up to you. This project is pretty small, so it doesn't really matter that much. We don't have a lot of organization. We now have a place to put our models from Blender. So let's return to Blender and then export them to this folder. To export the project, we can go to File, Select, Export, and choose the GLTF 2.0 option. This is a GL transmission format file. They are 3D files used in games and web applications. We could use other formats, but I prefer this one for reliability. Let's export to Godot and then check out our model. Don't worry if everything isn't perfect. We can adjust the materials within Godot. We can also export more objects to our model if we want, or fix our model and readjust our whole arena and then re-export. This is not a final version by any means, and we may always improve upon it. For now, we're just gonna keep moving forward. All right, so welcome to Godot. Godot is a game engine, and game engines make games. Godot looks very complicated to start, but there's actually much less to look at than in Blender. We will work our way around the screen and explain what everything is now. If we look to our upper left, we have the scene panel which shows us all the things in our scene. These things in Godot are called nodes. We will go more into depth after we explain a little more. If we click the import tab, we can alter how a resource is imported into our scene. We really don't need to change anything here yet, but we could use this to make a sound clip loop or edit other media before it's entered into the game engine. Below these panels, we have the file system tab, which allows us to view the files in our project. This is a pretty simple interface. You can right click to edit file names or move files. It is better to edit files through here instead of your regular file system. It keeps Godot in the know on where your files are. The viewport. To the right of that in the center of the screen is the viewport. This works very similarly to Blender where we can move around and use the 3D gizmo to our upper right to move our view to that position. We can also hold the right mouse button while pressing the WASD keys to move in first person mode in the viewport. There are many tools in the ribbon at the top. We will address these later. Below the viewport, there is a panel that changes based on your selection at the very bottom. If we click the output tab, we can see all the text output from the Godot engine. This will be important when we start coding, but for now, it's just a bunch of text. We can click through the rest of the options down here or double click the option it's on to close the panel altogether. We will go more into depth on these menus later, but for now we'll just minimize them. To the right, we can see we have an inspector tab, which is used to inspect a node once it is selected. All of the node's properties show up here and can be manipulated. If we click the node button next to that at the top, we can view the signals in groups of that node. This will be covered in the coding section of the tutorial. If we choose the history tab to the right, it will tell us all the changes we have made to this node. This can be useful if you forgot what you have done and want to change something back. The center menu is at the very top. It has 2D, 3D script, and asset lib buttons. 
and this will change our main screen's context. The 2D and 3D buttons are to change the respective viewports. If you have a HUD, that would be on the 2D section, and then if you have a 3D character moving in a 3D scene, that would be on the 3D section, and you can change between them easily here. The script button brings up the coding editor so you can code your game. The asset lib button allows you to access all the community plugins and assets made for Godot. We won't be using this because we are building everything from scratch. The final section to talk about is the menus at the very top left. The scene menus are like the file menu in a Word document. We can save our scene or open another scene here. To the right of the scene menus, we have the project menu, which allows you to edit project settings. Here we can add input from our keyboard to make the player do things. Or we can change screen settings or FPS settings on the actual game engine. The debug menu allows us to turn on and off debug settings so that we can see things a little clearer. We can do things like turn on and off collision visibility so we could see where maps are maybe colliding and where our character is falling off of things. The editor settings are next and they allow you to adjust the actual Godot editor settings to your liking. Uh, I normally leave them where they are. The final option is the help menu which is very useful once we start coding. I'll explain why shortly. Now that we know our way around Godot, let's make our first scene at the simplest level. Scenes hold our nodes. Our nodes are the things in our game, like the environment, the player, and the enemies. And we run the scenes to play our game. If you had an original Mario game for the Game Boy, you could think of the scenes as levels for now. When a scene is called upon to run or be played, we call this instancing. So we could say the scene is instance, or we are running an instance of that scene. Let's focus a little more on some of the nodes and we'll work our way up. There are many types of nodes in Godot that are used to make different objects in the game world. We could have a node that represents the player, a node that represents a chest, and even a node that represents the player's health bar. The node system is unique to Godot, and it's one of the reasons that I enjoy using the Godot engine. It simplifies things, and I'll walk you through a typical scene to display what I mean. We can click the plus button to add a new scene. Let's select the 3D scene, which will create us a node 3D. Let's press Control save to save this scene. You can choose a place to put the scene from the menu. Once we have our scene, we can press the plus bar in the scene panel to add another node to the scene. Let's do so and look at the menu we are given. All the nodes available to us are displayed here. In general, red nodes are for 3D purposes and green or blue nodes are for 2D purposes. We will have to use both in our games, 3D nodes for the player, and 2D nodes for the player's heads-up display. We want to make a simple cube mesh, so let's get to the search bar and type in Mesh Instance 3D. This is the node we want. After we select it, we click the Create button at the bottom to place the node in our scene. We don't see any mesh yet, but we do have the mesh instance node added as a child of our node 3D. If we select it in the scene panel, we can view its properties in the right hand inspector panel. If we look at the mesh property on the panel, we can see that it is empty. If we click on it, then we can select an option from the drop down. Let's choose the simple box mesh to start with. We can click on the cube in the inspector to bring up more options. Now we have our cube. If we choose the material option, we can choose to add a new standard material to our cube. If we click on the material slot, we will be able to edit the material options. Let's choose the albedo option and change the color just to demonstrate how it works. 
Looking through the options, we should see familiar names. We have the metallic option, the roughness option, and the normal map, just like we had in Blender. We will examine this further later. For now, we will continue our orientation to Godot. We can close the material options by clicking the material slot again after it is open. We can do the same to the mesh to simplify our inspector panel. Let's click now on the transform section of the mesh instance 3D. This panel holds our objects place in the game world. From here, we can alter the position, rotation, and scale of our object. Let's create our first scene to run in the engine. Return the cube to its default position by pressing the return button in the inspector panel or by manually changing the numbers to zero. Let's also rename our cube to Cool Cube. Let's click on the Node 3D at the top and click the plus to add another node to our scene. This time, type Camera 3D into the search bar and select that node. Press the Create button at the bottom to add this camera to our scene. This camera is how we will see the world at runtime. It will make more sense in a minute. For now, let's move the camera so our cube is in view. To make this easier, let's add a secondary viewport. Click the View button near the top of the screen. Select the Two Viewport option. Let's make sure the camera is selected first. Then in the bottom viewport, check the Camera Preview box. Now we are seeing what the camera will see. We can move the camera either using the Transform Properties or the Viewport Editor. Move it to a good position to see our cube. We are going to add our first script to the cube to move it around, and we want the camera to be able to see it. So we have our scene, and we want it to be a playable game. How do we do that? Well, first we go to the top, and we press the Run button, the one that looks like a Play button. We will probably get a message saying that there is no main scene to find, and we can select the current scene by pressing Select Current. This sets our current scene to run every time we press the play button. We can change this later for now if we want. Uh, for now it is fine. We can press play now and we can see the game world with our cube in it. This is how Godot works. We create scenes and then we can run them with the play button up there. We can link scenes together and have them play one after another to be levels or areas loading in and out of each other. And then we would eventually publish and export this entire game. And it would take all of our scenes, which we would be linking together through our storyline and through code. And that would be the entire game. That's a little abstract, but at least that's pretty much how it goes. So let's add a script to our cube object that will make it move around. Let's select our cube mesh and then select the Add Script button to attach a new script to it. When we click the button, we are greeted by the menu. We will go through the options really quickly, although we don't need to change much, if anything. The Language option allows us to change the language we are coding in. By default, we are set to use the GD Script language, which is the language of the Godot engine. It is best for beginners and good for what we are doing, so we'll stick with that for now. The Inherits box tells the engine what kind of script it is. It is placed on a Mesh Instance 3D node, so it will default to inheriting from the Mesh Instance 3D script. We won't really need to adjust this, and it can get complicated pretty quickly. So for now, just understand that this Inherits thing just means the engine knows what node this is and how to handle it. The class name is an advanced option we don't need for this tutorial, so we'll just skip it. The template option chooses whether you want some basic stuff added to your script to start you off. It is a good idea to leave this on for now because it is very helpful for beginners. We will see in a second. It is the same as having a template in a Word document, but just for programming. The built-in script is kind of a weird option. It will save the script in with the scene. It is mainly used for fast prototyping when you expect to be throwing away the script and the scene later so you can avoid clutter by saving them together and deleting them together. We want this to be unchecked so we create a script separately from our saved scene. The path is where the script will be stored. 
by default it will be named the same as your node in the scene panel. This one is called coolcube.gd. The gd extension tells Godot this is a gd script file. You can store the script separately from the scene. For instance, you could put all your scenes in a folder and all your scripts in a different folder. It doesn't matter to Godot. Everything looks good here, so let's create the script by hitting the create button down at the bottom. So we are now in the script editor. We can exit or return here by using the menu up at the top. We can also open or create scripts from here. Or we can close the side menu with the arrow. There is also an option called no distraction view, which can help us focus on just the code. Let's take a look at what we have. The extends mesh instance 3D at the top has to do with the inherits property we looked at when creating the script. It's just telling Godot that this script and node are going to be a mesh instance 3D. The next thing we can see is a grayed out line that says called when the node enters the scene tree for the first time. This is a comment. The hashtag at the beginning is telling the engine to ignore this line. This line is only here to help us, the user, understand the code better. It's not included into the code when the project is run. The next part that says func underscore ready, this is the start of a function. Function in programming are like subsets of instructions. We could imagine a washing machine as a program, and there could be functions for rinse, drain, and spin. Whenever the washing machine needs to run its cycle, it could just call the function spin, rinse, and then drain in whatever order until the process is complete. When we want to use a function, we call that function by invoking its name with parentheses. So for our washing machine example, a sample script would look like this. The function run wash cycle calls other functions in the order we need. This is the power of functions. It saves us from rewriting the code multiple times. Going back to our script now, this underscore ready function is also a special function within Godot because we don't need to call it anywhere. As the comment said, this function is called when the node enters the scene tree. Another way to say this is when the mesh instance 3D is created in the game world, this function will run automatically. The scene tree is a system in Godot that keeps track of all the nodes we are using. When a node is created in the game world, it is added to the scene tree. So let's do the simplest thing we can. We want to print out information on the scene from our script. Luckily, we can just use the print function. Like this, we type the word print with the parentheses and add our text inside the parentheses like this. The next thing we need to do is add quotation marks around the text to tell the engine, this isn't code, this is just text. So let's print the phrase, hello world, which is the traditional learning to code message. After we have this line in our ready function, let's try running the scene again and we can see the result. We can close the scene after opening it and then let's view our output tab, which should have our printed message, hello world. That's cool, but not very useful. Let's instead print some information about our cube. Let's use the print statement and say print position with no quotation marks. This is telling Godot to get the position of the cube in the world and print the result. Let's hit the run button and see the result. The position is displayed in the output tab. You can see the position is in the form of a vector three, which is just the coordinate system for a 3D world. The position is a property of our cool cube. We can view the properties in our inspector panel we can then use the names we find here to track or manipulate those properties of our object. Let's change the value of a property to see how it will affect the cube. Let's just type this line, scale.x equals 5 in the ready function. If we run the scene, we can see the cube mesh is scaled 5 times as large on the x-axis. Let's explore a little further. What if I want to change the color of the mesh? When I hover that property on the material, it just shows up as albedo color, but that's not enough info for Godot to understand what we want. Instead, we have to chain properties together with the dot operator to access those sub properties. So we could do something like print 
mesh.material.albedo color. The value we get returned here is the color of the mesh in the RGBA format. We will go over this later in more detail, but for now it's not super important. Just know we can access and influence properties of these nodes through code by identifying the property's name in the inspector. So now that we know how to run our scene and how to print info out to the scene, we should learn about variables in Godot. If you don't know what a variable is, it is simply a placeholder for a value. If you know algebra, x in the equation is the variable. It stands for another number. In coding, a variable could hold numbers, letters, or even an entire level. Let's create a few variables and then we'll see how we use them. We could do something like var my int equals 1. This gives us a number variable with a value of 1. We can call this type of variable an int or integer value variable. We can create another variable my float and set it equal to 2.2. .2. This variable is referred to as a float because it has a decimal value instead of being a whole number like an int. We can create a text variable referred to as a string by saying var my string equals and then here's a string with quotation marks which will create a text variable with the value of here's a string. In each case the var is a keyword telling Godot you are making a variable then the next part is the name of the variable. The equal sign is assigning a value to that variable and then whatever is on the right side of the equal sign is the value being assigned. Common variables that we will use will be things like the health of the player, the speed at which we run, or the damage our gun does, etc, uh, etc. Et we will be using variables in just about every script. Variables are a huge part of programming. So let's use a variable for a more useful purpose. Let's make a variable and move our cube to that position. If we look at our position in the game world, we notice we have three coordinates, x, y, and z. The x is horizontal, the z is forward and backward, and the y is up and down in Godot. When we printed our position, we got this result, and this is called a vector three. Really, it's just the format Godot needs to understand where you want to go. I'll demonstrate now by creating a variable called myVec3 and setting it equal to vector3002. Zero, zero, this will set the value of the variable to a vector3 with a value of a 0 on the x, 0 on the y, and a 2 on the z axis. We can then set our position equal to this variable to move to that position with our cube. When we run the scene, we can see the cube has updated its position. Computers are very OCD about how code is arranged. The rules by which the code is arranged is known as syntax. We can look at some general syntax in Godot to clarify. Notice the indentation of the lines of code that belong to the function. This is the syntax of functions. All code that belongs to it must be indented and underneath it. Another example of syntax at play is when we wrap the string variables in quotation marks to let Godot know not to interpret that part as code. So while it may seem like pointless complication at first, the objective is to be precise. The point of syntax is that the computer doesn't have to guess at what you want. It knows exactly what you are trying to do. Errors are caused when your code confuses the computer to a point where it cannot continue. You may notice some lines turning red on the screen and some text appearing near the output tab. This is an error and when it is due to incorrect syntax of your code, we call it a syntax error. This is stuff like forgetting a quotation mark or parentheses, missing a colon, or not indenting your line inside a function. The engine will typically identify and try to tell you what it does not like. If you can't figure it out from the message you get here, you can Google the error, 
and you can see how others have dealt with it online. Errors are misunderstandings on the computer's part that it cannot resolve by itself. A game engine tries its hardest not to crash or throw errors, but if we write code that it can't interpret, the engine will crash and display an error. It is nothing to worry about because this happens all the time. Getting an error and crashing your program is a natural part of coding and doesn't hurt your computer at all. Moving on to talk about the underscore process function. The process function runs every frame of the game. So this is used for things like getting input or movement because it is continuously running without us having to loop it ourselves. Let's demonstrate with an example. Let's put the same print statement we did in the ready function into the process function too. So we use the print command with parentheses and add a string inside the quotation marks to print out. Now we can run the program and see the result. We can see the print statement executed a ton of times instead of just one. So what's going on? The underscore process function is another special function in Godot that runs every frame. So when you say a game is running 60 FPS, that means that the logic of the game is able to execute fast enough to load everything 60 times a second. FPS, frames per second. So every frame, the process function is just printing the statement we asked it to. Instead, we want the game to check for input every frame. Input meaning is the player pressing a button that does something in the game. Going back to our process function, we can see that it has an argument called delta. Delta is the amount of time between the frames in the process function. We can actually print the delta variable by using the print command like this, print delta. Let's run the scene and check the results. We get a value of 0.0166 repeatedly printed out every frame. So every frame is taking about 0.016 seconds to run. If we divide 60 by 1, we get this number. This is because we are running at 60 frames per second. If this sounds like useless information, don't worry, we will use it later. Programming and concepts. So to get you coding, there will be many new concepts to learn. We have already seen a few of them like variables and covered rules like syntax. There are a few more components we need to get going. If you are new to all this information, it is probably pretty overloading. A lot of these concepts usually take a few hours to understand and we are going through them every few minutes. I made this guide because I learned all these things through separate videos which took years of time. Condensing everything into one space should help speed up the process. That being said, the next concept we need to cover are arguments and scope. They go hand in hand, so we kind of teach them together. To understand arguments, first we have to understand a concept called scope. Scope is basically where variables are available in a script. We will revisit our washing machine example to explore further. A variable defined inside of a function is scoped to the function. Other functions won't be able to use it because they don't know of its existence. If we make a variable in the wash function, we won't be able to use it in the rinse function because the variable is outside of the rinse function's scope. The rinse function has no idea what you are talking about. We can create a variable on the outside of the function in what's called the global scope. This variable will be available to all functions in the script. But if we had a situation like this, we have the run wash cycle function, which we will use to wash some clothes. We define the clothes as three string variables, one named socks, one named shirt, and one named shorts. We want to access these variables inside the other functions, but they aren't global variables, so their scope is limited to the run wash cycle function. One way we can fix this is to pass these variables in as arguments to our other functions. We do this by placing the variable name inside the parentheses when we call the function. We also need to tell our function receiving the argument to expect something. Not warning our function of an incoming argument will actually cause a syntax error in the editor. Telling the function to expect an argument and then not sending one will also result in an error. We can do this and send multiple variables as arguments as long as the numbers match up. 
3 expected, 3 cent. 2 expected, 2 cent. This is a basic explanation of arguments and scope. We will certainly get more practice with both. Continuing with our goal of getting player input, let's start really simple. First, we need to make a binary decision, meaning a two option decision. Is the button pressed or is the button not pressed? This is a good case for an if statement. An if statement will run if the condition given is true. We can test it now if we go back to our ready function and try a couple out. Let's comment out the print statement in our process function to make our output a little clearer. Let's get back in the ready function so our code runs just once. We can try an if statement by saying if one equals equals one colon print this is a true statement but with a indented line underneath it. Let's take a look at the syntax of the print statement. We have the if keyword, which tells Godot to evaluate if the condition we are checking is true. Next, we have the value one, which is the first of the values we are comparing. Then we have the double equal signs. This is to denote to Godot that we want to check the values instead of setting one equal to one. Two equal signs tells Godot, I want you to look at these two things and tell me if they are equal. One equal sign tells Godot to set the value of what is on the left to what is on the right. Finally, the colon at the end is signaling the end of the if statement check and to start the logic of the if statement. This is the part that runs if the statement is true. Everything below that block should be intended to run when the statement is triggered. Back to the if statement, we can also try if one equals equals two colon uh, next line and then a tab print this would be an untrue statement We can then run our scene and see that only the first print statement ran because the second statement was not true So if something is true then do something Getting a little less abstract. Let's say if the player presses the button then move forward with that understanding, the next part of the equation is the actual getting of the input, the registering of the button press by Godot. We need to use something called a singleton. A singleton is basically a script that is always available for us to call that has functions we can use. We can view the input singleton by going to the help menu and typing in input. If we click on the input singleton, we can see all the functions that we can use by calling it. This is the one we want, is action pressed. We will check if the action or button is down or up. Let's type in our process function print input dot is action pressed UI up. We can then run the scene. We should see a value of false occurring over and over again until we press the up arrow on the keyboard. Then we see the value say true. So whenever we press the button, the function is action pressed is actually returning a true or false value depending on whether the button is pressed or not. Now the following part was very dense with new ideas. The approach this tutorial is going to take is to think of these ideas for their utility and not give tons of theory behind the scenes. You may not know how a car works, but you know how to drive. The same theory applies here. You may not know exactly what an input singleton is at the moment, but you should understand that we can use the input dot is action press to check a button press. So let's combine the if statements assessment ability and the input singleton's return value to check for a button press. This would look like this. If input dot is action press UI up colon print we are pressing that button. Now let's run the scene. We can see now that every frame we have the up button pressed, we display the printed statement. If we apply this to moving, we could move every frame the forward button is pressed. Let's do just that with the W, A, S, and D keys. Do this by typing if input dot is action pressed and then a W inside of the quotation marks and a colon at the end. 
this time with the W key in the quotation marks, meaning we are checking for an action named W. For the block of the code to execute, we will move down a line and indent and then type this, position.x equals position.x plus one. What this does is add one to the X axis position of our cube for every frame the W button is pressed. By updating our position every frame, we achieve continuous movement. We can simplify this line by changing the part where we update our position. We can say position plus equals one. When we combine the plus with the equal sign, we tell Godot to take the value of the starting variable, then add the number on the right to it and set the value equal to the new number. It's just a shorter way of writing what we already wrote above. We just need to do one more thing before we can run our scene. We need to add the W input into the input menu in Godot. We can do this by selecting the project settings at the top and clicking the project settings from the dropdown. After that, we can select the input map tab. Here we add any actions to the game that we need. Let's type in W and press the add button. This will result in the action being created. We can then choose the plus button on the action to select which button will call this action. We want the W key on the keyboard, so press it and Godot will enter that button as its trigger. You can name the actions whatever you want and sync them to any button, but we will keep it simple for now. Let's make an A, S, and D actions and then add values to them accordingly. As a side note, when you call the input singleton, like we are doing here, the action name is what you are entering as a string in between the parentheses as an argument. So just make sure what you typed here matches what you typed here. Let's run the scene and see how our cube responds. When we press the W key, our cube shoots to the left. Our X position of the cube is being added every frame we have the W button pressed. It shoots off screen too fast though. Let's add other directions and address the speed issue in our script. To make the speed easy, let's make a global variable at the top of the script called speed. We will set it equal to 0.1, which will slow us down a bit. Now let's head down to the process function and add the other directions of movement. We first have to fix the direction of the cube's movement. Right now we are moving to the right. When we press the W key, we should be moving forward instead. So let's change the axis we are moving on from the X to the Z. Now we can add three more if statements with input checks to move the cube in all directions. I'm going to copy and paste instead of wasting your time typing it all. Let's go through it real quick. We basically just copy and paste, but we also have to change a few values here and there. First, we have to adjust the action name to match the button we want to check. We also change the axis we are moving on depending on the direction. Going one direction on an axis is adding to our position, while going the other direction on an axis is subtracting from our position. I have it separated out a little to make it easier to read and understand. Let's run that scene and see what happens. The cube should move in all four directions and diagonally if we press the two buttons. Now we are going to start creating our player. This isn't as bad as it sounds. Godot has many time-saving features that we will take advantage of. We have an understanding of the ecosystem at this point. We understand that the flow of the Godot engine is to create scenes with nodes in them and code the nodes to make the gameplay actually work. It seems simple enough. If you are new and you have gotten here, congratulations. It takes a while to understand these things. Uh, should be proud of where you've gotten. We want to continue moving on by creating the player so we can walk around the game world that we created earlier in Blender. So let's create a new scene by pressing the plus button in the middle top of the main window. When we have that scene open, click the plus in the scene inspector to create the root node of that scene. We want to create a character body 3D node, so we search and create one with the menu. Let's rename the node to player and save the scene by pressing Control S. 
Because we have never saved this scene before, a menu will appear asking us where we want to save. I will create a new folder called Player and save the scene there. We can view the Docs page for this node by searching it in the Help menu. The node is described as this, a 3D physics body specialized for characters moved by script. In simpler terms, use this node for your player character. We will be back to this page later, but for now we need to return to the 3D editor to complete the setup of our player. If we hover over the little yellow warning triangle, we get a message saying this. The node has no shape and it can't collide or interact with objects. Consider adding a collision shape 3D. This means we have no shape in the game world, we are just a formless character entity. We need a shape to tell Godot how big we are and what we are bumping into. In Godot, anything that collides with each other in 3D will usually need a collision shape 3D node. Let's add one using the scene inspector menu as a child of our character body 3D. When we find the node and press create, it is added to our player scene. Let's go ahead and rename that node in the scene tab by double clicking it slowly. I'll name the collision shape 3D node as player collision. We still have a warning on the collision shape with a triangle and when we hover it, Godot relays this to us. A shape must be provided. Making sure that our collision shape is selected, let's add a shape by clicking the shape dropdown in the inspector. We will choose capsule mesh for our player shape. In the 3D viewport, we can see now we have the outline of a capsule shape. Let's move the position of our capsule shape so it is level with the ground grid. This makes sure our player will stand on the ground. If we check the inspector of the capsule mesh, we can see that the height of the capsule is 2. So setting the position to half of that on the y-axis will mean the shape sits perfectly on the ground. We may need to adjust the shape of our player later, but for now, don't worry too much. If we were to run the scene right now, we would get no errors, but we would see nothing at all, just a gray screen. This is because there is no camera in the scene, so Godot has no idea where or what to show. We need to add a camera to our player so we have a viewport into the game world. All of the interaction in a game is for the benefit of the user. A computer would be perfectly happy to display a blank screen all day without complaint. So we want to add the camera, but we have to add a node first to help the camera work properly. So let's click the plus sign in the scene tab to add a new node and select the basic 3D node from the list. After we have added that node, let's click the Add Node button again and add the Camera 3D node. Your scene structure should look like this. Your character body is the root, your collision shape and your node 3 are siblings, and the camera is a child of the node 3D. Child nodes move with their parents, so in a way our root node is just a placeholder for everything that is our player. Let's rename the node 3D holding our camera to camera holder. This makes its function a little clearer. We are making an FPS, so let's move the camera up to the position where a head would be. We don't actually want to move our camera though, we want to move our camera holder node. This may seem like needless complication, but it'll make more sense later on. We are now going to code our character. I like to think of this as giving the character the ability to interact with the game world. The first interaction we need, of course, is movement. Godot has a template script made for character body 3D nodes that gives us FPS movement. We will use the template script to get us going faster. Now we can add a script to our player to get him moving. Make sure our root player node is selected. We can press the add script icon in the scene tab to open our script menu. We don't have to change anything unless you want to alter the name. Godot is starting us off with a run of the mill FPS script for a character body 3D. Godot offers templates like this for certain nodes that are specific enough to warrant it. We can open the script and take a closer look. With the script open, we can see that at the top we have the extends keyword just like before. And just like before, following the extends keyword is the type of node we are using. 
Simple enough. We don't really need to understand it, it's just there and it's doing its thing. We continue down and see some variables. These variables are not being defined with the var keyword, instead they are being created with the const keyword. Const is used to define a variable that should never change. The speed and the jump velocity of the character shouldn't change, so movement feels consistent. We cannot assign a new value to a constant. The engine won't let us. It's a restrictive measure to save us from ourselves. Our character's speed should influence his movement and not actually change. Continuing down, we have a var for gravity, and it is equal to a singleton that is using a function to retrieve a value. This is working in the same way as our input singleton earlier. That one checked for a button press value and returned it. This one checks for a value we can change in the settings menu that affects the entire engine's gravity. That is not needed. We could just set it to like 10 or some other number, so we are constantly pulled down just like real gravity. But this is nice because now we fall at the same rate as other objects in the game, and we don't even have to code it. Moving on to the meat of this script, we see the physics process function. This is the same as the process function, except this one is better suited to handle physical objects in our game, like people or cars or barrels or other things that might fall. After that, we see that we have an if statement. The keyword not is used to reverse the check of the condition, meaning only fire if this is not true. The function is on floor is a function that is available to us because we extend the character body 3D script. If this were a mesh instance node instead of a character body 3D node, this function would not be available to us. The function is on floor is built into the character body 3D nodes. We can view this function's docs by checking the help page in the docs we pulled up earlier. We could always retype it into the help menu, but once you pull up the help page for a node, it stays in your recent scripts menu. And you are wondering, how do I know what is available to me and for which node? The help docs are your answer. Let's check the documentation for the isOnFloor method to demonstrate. We can see that it checks the player character and to see if it's touching the floor. This is what we needed the collision shape for, so the character has collision and can touch objects. In this case, the floor. The indented line beneath the if statement is applying our gravity to the y component of our character's velocity variable. The velocity variable you won't find defined in a script with the var keyword. Instead, it is built into the character body 3D script, just like the is on floor function. We can again view this variable in the documentation page, but really it is what it says it is, our player's velocity. How fast is the player currently moving? This is our velocity. This is different from our speed, which is how fast our character should be moving when we want to move. Here we are influencing the y component of our velocity, which is a vector three. The y component in Godot is up and down, so it makes sense gravity would be applied here. We are again using the minus equals operation here to shorten what we type. The line beneath it that is commented out would do the same thing. The gravity variable we discussed earlier is a number that is set in our project settings for convenience. The multiplication by delta is new to us. As a refresher, the delta variable is a number that stands for the amount of seconds passed since the last frame update. Multiplying by delta will move us at the rate of the physics process function. This keeps us in sync with the physics of the game. Don't get too caught up in this for now, we can just leave it as it is. The next part of the code is allowing the player to jump. The if statement is using the AND keyword to check two conditions at once. This means that only if both of these conditions are met will the code below function. In this case, the two conditions are that one, the player press the spacebar here called UI accept, and the second is that the player is on floor. We check if the player is on floor because we don't want to be able to jump up and up into the atmosphere. We only want to be able to jump off the ground if we are on it. Just like in real life, you can't just keep jumping to fly. So once we know the character is on the ground and the player has pressed the jump button, we apply the jump velocity constant to the velocity.y value, pretty much applying the opposite of gravity. Why don't we have to multiply it by delta or use the plus equals operator? because of how gravity works. 
When an object is falling, it will get faster and faster until it is at terminal velocity. We mimic this in Godot by adding velocity.y to itself in the gravity section. So each frame the object is falling, it is moving slightly faster. When we jump, we don't want this effect. We just want to move up and then let gravity push us back down again. We aren't gaining inertia the higher up we go. We are overcoming gravity and then being overcome by its influence seconds later. Of course, we don't really need to change anything, so don't worry too much about any of this. We won't really need to change too much here anyway. Moving down, we have a variable called input dir. This stands for input direction. This is the direction the player is pressing on the keyboard. W for forward, S for backward, A for left, and D for right is the standard. We can see the value of input dir is actually the return value of a function. That function is from our input singleton. We can view that function's docs to better understand what it does. Now is a good time to mention that we can open up the docs page on something by holding the control key and left clicking the keyword we want to explore. Once there, we can hit the back button in the upper right hand corner to return to our previous script. This is much faster than having to search it every single time if you haven't already opened that page. It says that this function gets an input vector by specifying four actions for the positive and negative x and y axis. Basically, it is going to take the four buttons we press, w, a, s, and d. When one of the buttons is pressed, it will take that into account and change the value of the vector 2 it is returning based on that button press. We can put a print statement here to view the vector 2 we are getting back. Let's do that and run the scene. We don't have this function set to our keys yet. Instead, we have to use the arrow keys to see the change. So when we press forward, we return a vector of 0, negative 1. If we hit backwards, we will have a vector of 0, 1. If we go to the right, the D key, our vector is 1, 0. If we go left, our vector is negative 1, 0. This is just a way for us to assign a number value to each key press that we can apply to our player's velocity. So now we have the input direction, which is the direction we want to go. The next variable named direction translates our input direction into an actual direction for the character to move in. Think of it this way, with just the button input, we could move, but if we were to rotate ourselves in the game world, we would move in the wrong direction. Without accounting for the character's rotation, W will always move us forward in the game world, but it may be sideways for the player. So in simple terms, we just apply our character's rotation to the direction we want to go in. This will give us FPS movement. So here's a good example. We have our character here, and this red, uh, box is denoting where our character is facing. So right now we're facing forward. So we can imagine that if we're moving our character in the uh, forward uh, direction, we're pressing the W key, so we're moving forward, and uh, maybe we're pressing the A key and moving to the left, or the D key moving to the right. That's all fine, but the second we are rotating our character here, so we rotate this, uh, let's say, 90 degrees, so we're facing the other direction there. And now if we hit the W key, we're still going to move this way because we're not moving based off the character's rotation. We're moving based off the world's orientation. So if we press W, we're going to keep moving this way, even though the character is facing that direction, and we really want to be moving that way. So we have to adjust for that by multiplying by the basis of the character, which is essentially just the rotation and scale put into a complicated math equation. But we don't really have to fuck with that. All we really have to do is just uh, multiply it. So. so how we do this is by applying our character's basis to the input vector. This will orient our player's input with the player's current rotation. The basis is a sub-property of our transform property. We can view our transform by clicking the player node and viewing the transform menu in the inspector. The basis is not specifically listed here, but it is the combination of the rotation and scale values found in this panel. We can also view the documentation for basis by going to the help menu. Let's do that quickly just to have the page available if needed in our quick menu. The math that makes this work is pretty complex the more you study it. But the whole point of using a game engine is that most of the hard, tedious work is already done for you. All we need to know for our level right now is that we apply our basis to our input direction to move our player according to his own rotation in the game world. 
Let's look at the rest of the line after the basis. We are multiplying by a vector 3. The x and z components of that vector 3 are from our input direction variable. We add a 0 for the y component because we don't want to influence that axis of movement with these buttons. The y would be up and down, whereas the x and z are forward, backward, left and right. We can't multiply a vector 2 by a vector 3, which is why we add that 0 for the y so we can multiply by our basis, which is a vector 3. The normalized function added to the n is a function unique to vectors that is pretty mathematically complex. For us, it just means that our character will move at the same rate going forward and backwards as they will diagonally. So if we press the left and up keys, our character would move faster without this function diagonally than it does normally going straight. But with this function, we fix that. So that's all we have to do is just add it to the end there. Let's keep moving. There is no need to overcomplicate things for now. We have the player input accounted for. We know which direction we want to go. Now we just have to apply it to the player node. Looking at the next if statement, we can see that it says if direction. We know an if statement assesses whether something is true or false, but how can a vector 3 be true or false? Well, a 0 to Godot, and in most programming languages, is interpreted as a false value. So if we have a vector 3 with a 0 value for each component, then it's the same as having a 0. So what this if statement is assessing is whether the player is pressing a movement button. When the player presses a button, our direction changes from a 0 value to a non-zero value, making it true and running the code in our statement. So what does the code in our statement do? Well, here we can finally set our velocity to the x and z components of our direction vector. This moves us forward, backward, left and right in the game world. We multiply that number by our player's speed. Without this, we would move really slow. After the if statement, we have an else statement, which runs if the condition we listed in our if statement is false. In this case, if the player is not pressing anything, the if statement will be false and the else statement code will run. Inversely, when the player presses a button, the if statement is now true and the else statement code will not run. The else statement here just gently moves our velocity back to zero when we aren't pressing buttons. We can view what the move toward function does by holding control and clicking on it. In this case, it just slows our inertia to zero. This will make the movement much smoother and less jumpy. At the bottom, we see the move and slide function. This function is the call to Godot to update our player's position based on our velocity. We have just learned a lot, so let's leave it at that. The only thing we need to change is the action buttons being used in the get vector. We need to replace the UI stuff with our actions W, A, S, and D that we made earlier. Just make sure to put them in the right place. Left is A, right is D, up is W, and down is S. If you find yourself moving in the wrong directions, check here. We can do something fun now, which is ready our blender scene to put our player in. So if you remember from earlier in the tutorial, we exported our blender file uh, to Godot, um, our thing that we made and uh, I'll show you I actually made some mistakes so we're gonna have to re-export it um, so let's jump in here where did I put it I think it's level A there we go so we can just drag that in and you can see if we click on let's uh, we have to right click and say make local that way it's local to this scene and we can edit it and I just want to hide that so we can see we have this plane on the ground that I meant to extend to both sides and I mirrored it but I didn't apply the modifier in blender uh, and I was just showing you that that's what it's gonna look like the other half won't be there so if I uh, maybe I can do this See over here, it looks like I have the whole thing. Well, that's because I have the modifier still not applied. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. So that way we get the entire shape there coming over, this entire shape here. 
So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to re-export this by saying uh, file export gltf. We of course got to go to I think it's test project. Yeah, um, we'll go to let's just make a new folder and say bestest levels and uh, we'll go here and we're going to do better level we'll go ahead and save we don't really have to change anything we can then go back to here we don't need this one anymore we'll just delete that root node we can then uh, go down and let's see where that folder is at uh, bestest levels and then we'll drag that one in and let's just go to it real quick and turn the transform back to zero so now you can see uh, well let's go ahead and make it local now we can see that uh, if we drop that down our plane is the full shape so if you have shapes that aren't appearing or they're looking like they're hollow or just kind of weird uh, go back to Blender and check your modifiers because your modifiers might be part of the issue. So now that we have this, we want to click on the plane here or whatever you want the character to be walking on or colliding with, and we have to make a uh, collision shape. So we come up here after we have it selected, we go to Mesh and we say Create Tri Mesh Static Body. And you'll see these little blue lines appear uh, might be hard for you to see them because um, of where they are, but uh, they appear on the model. You can kind of see them a little better over here if I bring this up. There we go. These little blue lines here. So now, now that I have this better level there, what I'm going to do is click this little chain link, which will allow you to instantiate a child scene. And we want to instantiate our player. So we click on the player and we have him here and we want to put him right in the center of our game world. So we'll bring him up that way we're standing on the thing right there. He's going to fall down a little bit and we can go ahead and run this, but we have to save it as something. So we'll save it as um, best level uh, a. So now using our W, A, S, and D keys, we can move around in this little game world. However, we cannot turn yet, which is what we'll be implementing yet, uh, implementing next. So stick around um, and we'll be doing more stuff, getting this going, uh, getting close to being actually fun now. So we have our player and we can move up, down, left, and right, but we can't turn our character. So we want to implement that now. And to do that, we have to take more player input and then take that input and influence it on the node. In this case, we are going to turn our entire character in the Y axis when our mouse moves left and right, and that will make our character move left and right accordingly. Let me go ahead and turn that back to zero. We'll go back to the script and I'm going to paste these two functions in here and then we'll go over them. So this ready function here, we've already seen this function runs every time that the player enters the game scene. Well, when the player enters a game scene, it's only gonna do it once, but as soon as the player enters, this function is ran. The input.setMouseMode what this does is it uses the input singleton and it captures the mouse so that the mouse can't move and the uh, cursor is not seen. If you think about Call of Duty or any other game, you're not going to fly your mouse off the screen and then be clicking on other programs. You don't want to be doing that. You want it to be locked to the screen. That's what this enables right here. The next function we haven't seen before, it's the input function and it takes in an event, and the event is basically any key that's being pressed on your keyboard. So if you press any key, or you move your mouse or scroll the mouse, that's registered as an event with Godot. And so we're taking this if uh, statement here, 
and we're saying if the event is of the type input event mouse motion meaning did we move our mouse then we're going to rotate uh, our character on the y-axis like I said earlier to the relative movement of our x um, axis of our mouse so that means left and right on the mouse is rotating our character left and right in the game just like we would think about uh, in an FPS movement. <clears throat> we are not yet accounting for going up and down, but let's just go ahead and see how this works. And this deg to rad, what it's saying is degrees to radians. So we're taking the degree that we get here, converting that to radians, and then we are sending that to our rotate y function because rotate y needs um, radians and not degrees and this just makes it more efficient. So I think it's more efficient than doing it with all degrees, but uh, don't stress too much about that right now. Let's go ahead and save. We'll go back to our level here and run it. Now we can see we can move and we can move left and right. We have some graphical issues, but we can address those a little bit later. And uh, let's go ahead and fix the moving up and down. We can also go ahead and add something that's going to make our life a little bit easier if we add in this line here. If event dot is action pressed UI cancel. Uh, this is the escape button. That means that we will quit. So get tree dot quit just quits the game. That way, when our mouse is locked, we don't have to worry about pressing the Windows key to get out of it or anything. So we can run the game now, and as soon as we want to quit, we just hit the escape key and we're done with it. So. That's, uh, that's the best way to do it. All right, now that we have that done, let's go ahead and add the up and down so we can look up and down. Uh, for that, we're actually not going to add anything to the player script. We're going to create a new script on our camera holder. And uh, let's just go ahead and name it camera holder. Since this isn't a built-in name, we can name it that and it won't give us any warnings. So we'll create that. And then we're actually going to take um, this exact line right here and we can just control C copy it that's what moves us on the Y axis for our player and instead what we're gonna do is move ourselves on the X axis of our camera holder so we'll change that from X to Y and just for demonstration if we go to our player in the 3d and we look at our camera holder here this is what we're moving is our x-axis of our camera holder and we don't want to actually move our camera we want to move the camera holder because it'll be easier to deal with so now if we go back to our level having added that into our script right here making sure to change the y and the x respectively we can run the level and we should be able to look up and down left and right and move in all directions and we move with whatever direction we're looking at so that's good there are no limits to how far up or down we can look so we could look all the way around and make ourselves sick which I'm not going to do and if we fall off the edge here we slip into the abyss and fall forever because there's nothing to collide with down here but we can fix all that and we'll keep going Let's uh, keep doing fun stuff. All right, so our scene really looks like shit when we go into it, so we're going to uh, zazz it up a little bit. So first thing we can do is grab our plane here, and we really don't want this to be seen. So we can actually grab the static body and just pull that out of here, I believe, and hit that. What is that error saying? Non-uniform scale. Uh, I guess we didn't apply the scale. So if I go back to my Blender file here and I look at the scaling for this object, we can see the scale is actually not all uniform which uh, normally isn't a problem if you're just doing meshes that are just going to be somewhere, but if you're doing meshes that are going to have um, collision based off them, 
collision and scaling doesn't really work so well in Godot. So you want to make sure that this is scaled all to the uh, one. Um, not all to the one, but it's all scaled normally. So I just got to click on that. I got to go control A and then we'll apply the scale. The, uh, the other ones here, the location and rotation, you can leave those where they are. That's completely fine. Uh, let's just grab everything in the scene by doing control A. And we're going to go, uh, yeah, we'll just hit A and then control A and then scale. So now everything uh, has been scaled. So we can file, export, GLTF, and we're actually going to go to the documents. Um, where is it at? Uh, test project, um, bestest level, and we're just going to save right over top of it. And then we're going to go back to Godot, and we'll probably have to just take this and delete it. And then we'll just drag it back in. Uh, yeah, right here. We'll go here and set it to transform to zero, and then we will make it local. And now, if we say mesh, create tri mesh static body, we don't get an error there. We can pull that out, and then we can just hide that because there's really no reason for it to be there. So now, if we run the scene, we sit on the actual ground. And uh, you can see the textures don't look so great. Um, well, we're gonna fix that. One thing we can do to fix that is if we click on some of these right here. Uh, yeah, we'll click on this. We can adjust the textures here. So we'll come down and I am going to activate triplanar. We'll see how that looks. So that's what that does. And we can adjust the scale so if you want this type of look, you can go like 0 0.02. I think that would look pretty good. We don't have to use triplanar. We can still just adjust here by clicking and dragging. But I'm going to go ahead and use it because I think it looked a little bit better. Keep it right about there. If I run that, that's looking a little better. Another thing we could do is go to our player. Uh, this really doesn't have to be done, but we can take our camera holder and move it up to about there. I think that's about the height the player should be. We're going to go to our player collision and we'll click that so we can get a good X axis reference. And then we're just going to go there and move our character right on up. We're just adjusting our capsule shape and then bringing our capsule up. So that looks pretty good right there. Uh, we're going to save that. Now if we go back to our level, we should be sitting a little bit higher off the ground. And that feels a little more normal to me. So the next thing we can do is um, adjust these again go into the material and you can really change whatever you want in here I mean you could uh, change your texture if you want you can adjust the color if you wanted to we could make it more bluish or whatever but um, for now I'm just going to adjust the UV maybe adjust the scale a little bit and I think uh, right about there looks a little more reasonable let's just put it at three so I'll probably go around and do that for uh, most of these objects. If you were a real artist and you were like super into UV editing and all that stuff, you could do a better job of this. I really don't enjoy it, so I just kind of take an approach to just get it done. Um, I think that looks pretty decent. Uh, let's have a walk around this scene now. It's looking a little better. We do need to add something and that is the world environment. So if we go to the add node uh, menu and we add world environment, this is what actually gives us all of our shading. 
we click on environments, we say new, and then we have to fill this out a little bit. We have a clear color background, which is not what we want. We want a, uh, I think we want a sky. Then we select our sky, we can say new sky. And this is basically how Godot works. You just have to keep on filling out all this shit until it's got all the stuff that it needs. So we can do, uh, let's do new panorama and then we can add a panorama in here. And I believe I actually made a panorama somewhere. Yeah, we're gonna try this. We'll drag in that star field. There we go. All right, so now we have a sky background. We can make that a little bit larger. And we can come down here and add different type of effects and light. So we can minus or uh, subtract or add to the sky contribution or the energy of our sun. So let's jump back in now and see what it looks like. Very dark. As we can see, there's not a lot of energy to things. So we can go here and add a light. And we have different types of light. We have uh, directional, which is like a sun. Omni light is like a candle or a light bulb. And then spotlight is like a spotlight. So let's do uh, a sun type light and we'll go on this view here. Actually, let's not, it's kind of vomit inducing. Uh, let's go here and we'll bring this up and we'll spin it. We just want to spin it that way so that the light is kind of tilted down. And we want to tilt the light a little bit like that. Give us a little more, I don't know, ambience or whatever. And we can also color the light or we can darken it. Uh, we can give it like a, a nice, nice reddish or like a nice uh, kind of yellowish hint. So um, yeah, we can also apply more energy to it or lessen the energy we're giving. So that's one light and let's go ahead and add another light. This will be a Omni light and we'll make that bigger, bring it up and then put it over here in this room so that the room is illuminated. And this is the radius of the light. We can go over here and change the radius over here too. So let's go ahead and just give that a try. So there we go. We can see in the game world a little more clearly. Still not looking amazing. We still have a lot of stuff to adjust. But it's getting there. So let's arm our character. I'll show a time lapse of me creating a shotgun in Blender. I created a Mac 10 and a Glock pistol as well that we will put on the wall for the player to purchase. We may make more items, but for now this will demonstrate enough. We are going to equip the shotgun to our player first. We will use a Node 3D to create a weapon holder similar to what we did with our camera holder. This just makes it easier for when we change weapons later, we will have a holder to parent the weapons to. We make the weapon holder node a child of our camera holder node so that the gun looks where we look with our camera. We then drag and drop our shotgun GLB into the scene once in the scene, we will right click on the node in the inspector and then select make local. We will then right click on the node again and select save branch as scene. This creates a scene just for our shotgun. We can now instance our shotgun on our player when we need it. Let's add some animation to our shotgun. We need four animations, pump, fire, reload, and misfire. In Godot, we use the animation player nodes to animate things. Let's add one to the shotgun scene now. We can click on the node and then open the animation menu at the bottom if it isn't already open. 
we can then click the animation button to create a new animation. We then add tracks to influence the properties of the node. We can animate just about any property and even call functions through animations. What we're going to do now is just pump the shotgun by moving the pump and rotating the shotgun up slightly. We will then add sound to the animation after that. So to use animations, we create tracks. Let's add a track now and have it act on the pump of the shotgun. The tracks hold keyframes, which are just marks telling the track where the object should be at that time. We can demonstrate that here by selecting a keyframe and changing its value on the right. Let's create a keyframe for the starting position of the handle. After that, we duplicate and drag it to the end of the animation. Now let's add a new one in the middle and move the handle back slightly on the Z axis. Now we can press the repeat on button to the side and play the animation to see the result. It looks okay, but let's add a tilt to the gun when cocked to make it a little more realistic. So we add track and then select the shotgun node at the top to select its rotation property. We do the same keyframe setup to affect our gun's rotation and this looks a little better when we play it back. Let's duplicate this animation by clicking the animation button and selecting the duplicate option. Name this one fire and remove the movement of the pump to leave just the rotation. We then move the middle keyframe further towards the front of the timeline, making the gun jerk more when fired. The reload animation is a little trickier because we have a shell to move around as well. We use the same track method to rotate the shotgun up, ready for the shell. We then have a shell come up from the bottom of the screen and go into the gun. We then lower the gun. We are also using a visible track to toggle the visibility on and off for the shotgun shell. I'm not really going to go all out on these animations. We will animate our enemies in Blender, but understanding the animation system in Godot is important as well. Let's add a blast for our shotgun next. We will use a new node called the GPU Particles node. This is used for stuff like smoke or fire or a scatter shot. A particle system is a node in Godot that spawns a bunch of something in a pattern. Add a GPU particles node into the scene and navigate to the inspector options. We are first looking for the draw passes. Draw passes are the thing that we are spawning copies of. We can do flat planes or objects created in Blender. Here we are going to use spheres as our mesh just like a shotgun shot. We can edit the shape of the mesh as well. So let's make it 0.05 here and uh, 0.1 on the height to make them BB sized. Then I will decrease the amount of radial segments and rings. We do this because we didn't really need high definition geometry for fast moving pellets. They're just an indicator of where we are shooting. This saves the computer having to process more geometry. This isn't significant enough to really affect anything, but it's good practice to always try to do less with more. Here's where we set our materials as well. For now, let's just create a new material and set the vertex color attribute to use as albedo. This allows us to control the color of the material through our particles node. After we have this set, let's move to the process material. This tells Godot how to move and distribute the particles. This field will be empty so we can click and create a new particle process material. Now we have a bunch of fields to alter how our particles move. We want a scattershot effect first, so let's change the gravity to zero. Then we can set the initial velocity to 30 for both the minimum and the maximum. Our particles are now flying our all over. We can narrow the spread by going to the direction and changing the spread there. We will set it to 5. Let's go up to time now and set the explosiveness to 1. This will create a blast effect. Now we can edit the color of the particles. We could either choose to pick the color attribute 
where we choose to select the color ramp, which allows us to change the color of the ramp over time. I'm going to create a yellow to red white transition on the particles. We could do a lot here, but I'm just going for something basic. Let's take the particle system and rotate it to be at the mouth of the barrel. To be clear, these are just going to be for show. They do not actually collide with anything in the game world. These particles are a visual indicator to the player of where he is shooting. We are now going to add raycast to the gun so that it can hit targets. Let's click the add node and add a node 3D to our shotgun. We will name this one ray holder. We will then position this to the mouth of the barrel as well. We will then add a raycast node as a child of the holder. A raycast is basically a long straight line that checks for collision. We will shoot eight rays for the eight pellets and try to match the spread of our particles. This makes it match up with what the player sees and what the collision actually is. Let's change the orientation of our raycast to extend negative 20 in the Z direction. I think that is a good range for the shotgun. We can then rotate the raycast around to match the spread of our particle. It doesn't have to be precise, just make it close. This is a very simplistic approach, but it's easy to understand. Let's repeat this seven more times with raycast to get eight rays. With them all spread out, we can see how an enemy up close will be hit more times than an enemy far away. You could make the spread larger or smaller by adjusting both the particles and raycast, but I like the way it is here. Now we just need to add the sounds to the shotgun. To do this, we need to add an audio stream player node. We want the gray one at the bottom, not the 2D or the 3D, which are louder based on proximity. Adding it to the scene, we can call it fire sound. I have readied audio clips that I got from opengameart.org. We can drag and drop the sound clip directly into the audio stream player. We will make three more audio stream player nodes for the other sounds the shotgun makes and name them appropriately. We will also add the sound clips to them. Now we have all the parts of the shotgun ready to go. We just need to write the script to give the shotgun functionality. All right, so I'm gonna demonstrate the shotgun script uh, that I built and then I'll go over it. So we have six rounds in our inventory right now and we have three in the chamber. So once we expend those three, we have to reload. And then we can fire three more. And then we can reload. And then after these three, if we press the reload button, we get a misfire sound. And once we fire our last round here, we get a misfire. So all the parts of the shotgun we need are there. And uh, yeah, I'll just jump into the code now. So the variables up here, we will talk about as we see them in the script. First, let's look at the process function. What we are doing here is first checking if our gun is the active gun for our character. Right now, it doesn't matter because we only have one gun. However, we will need this when we start switching weapons. The next statements should look familiar. These if statements are getting the player input. In this case, if the player is pressing the reload or fire button. Let's run through the logic of these statements. The first statement is checking if we are pressing reload. If we are, next we check the can fire variable defined at the top of our script. We use this variable to guard against the player spamming the fire button. Without this variable, we could just fire over and over again without pumping the gun. By setting this to false when we shoot or reload, it stops us from restarting the reload or the shot we are currently taking. So in other words, what this statement asks is, are we currently reloading or firing? If so, you can't fire or reload right now. If we are free to reload, we then go to the reload function. Here we first set the can fire variable as discussed. Then we get how many rounds we need to fill the gun. We subtract the max rounds the gun can hold, which is three, from the current amount of ammo in the gun. So if we have one round in the gun, our variable should be two, because we need two rounds to fill the gun up. 
the if statement then asks if the ammo in the player's inventory is enough to cover the rounds we need to put in. If we have enough in the inventory, we just subtract the rounds from the inventory and add them to the ammo in the gun. However, if we have less than enough to fill the gun, we move on to another check. Here we check if we have any rounds at all. If we have more than zero, we put in all we have and clear the inventory. If we have no rounds at all, our gun calls the misfire sound play. We then set the can fire variable to true so we can attempt to fire again or reload when we get ammo. The return keyword tells Godot to exit the function there and stop running it. So the code beneath this return is never ran if that branch is taken. In all the cases but the no ammo at all return case, we play the animation, which is why it's here at the bottom. So after the reload input check, we have the fire input check. We do the can fire check and then we make sure that there are not actually rounds in the gun. If the gun is unloaded, we force a reload. If we have some rounds in the gun, we move to the fire function. In the fire function, we set the can fire to false. We also set off a burst from our GPU particles node by setting the emitting value to true. The next line is subtracting one from the ammo in our gun. The print statements just help us to keep track but are not needed. The next lines play the sound and animations that we set up earlier. The animation player needs a name for the animation whereas the audio node does not need that argument. The last part of the script is the long named function down here. This is actually a signal function. This function alerts us when an animation finishes on the animation player node. We are going to use this to recock or reset our shotgun. For example, we shoot and play the fire animation. When the animation finishes, the animation node will emit a signal telling the script what animation just finished playing. This is the argument we see in the function. So we can then set up logic based on the animation we are coming from. If we just fired, we need to pump the gun. If we just pump the gun, we need to enable firing through the can fire variable. This is called an animation driven approach. We do need to change a couple things on our particles to get them to work correctly. We need to take the lifetime down to 0.9. When we fire, we shoot particles, then we pump our gun. Our pumping animation is one second and we need to wait for the particles that are on the screen to die before spawning more. So we need to make the pumping animation slightly longer than our lifetime of the particles. So we set our particles to 0.9 and our pumping animation to one second and we should be all good. This is a shitty fix, but it's a quick fix for now. Just to explain a little more about signals, we can see that there is a signal coming from this node over here. Uh, it says node has one connection. If we click on the node and then we go to the signals tab over here, we can actually see all the connections it has. We can even disconnect them and then we can actually reconnect them as well. We just connect and then we know we want to influence the shotgun script right here. So we press connect and it will automatically generate this for you in here. I'll demonstrate it real quick. So this will signal whenever the animation is changed and I can connect it to our shotgun node. If I hit connect here, it actually creates the script for us down here. Now we don't really need this, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of it and then disconnect it up here. But just know that is how we made this script and this signal right there. We'll use signals more uh, but this is a very brief introduction and they're very useful in Godot. So another important concept to address would be return statements and I kind of glossed over them a little bit but let's take a better look at them. So I have this ready function right here and we're creating a variable called x and then we're actually setting that variable equal to the return value of this function here and we're passing in the variable 5 to the return number so our number goes in here and all we do is return it back so if I 
run this now, we get the number five because we're printing it out right after the function has ran. And so what the return number does is it ceases the functions running and then returns the number immediately back here, back to whatever line called it. So this line six right here. So this print right here is never actually ran because it's underneath the return. So this is never going to print if it's under the return statement. If we move it instead to be up here, we can see that it runs. But uh, anything underneath the return will never run in the function. So moving it back down here, it'll never run. Now, usually in the function, there'll be some type of logic here. Uh, so it'll be like num plus equals 10. So we're changing this number and then returning it and then setting it equal to a value. That's normally why you would be using this in the first place. But it's very important to understand how the return keyword works. We can now go back to our shotgun script and here we need to add a collision check for all of our raycasts. We could do this one by one, but now is a good chance to introduce for loops into the equation. For loops will loop for a specific amount of times. The format of the for loop is as follows, for blank in blank, and then the logic goes below just like an if statement. Let's look at the example script I have here. The i in the for loop is a variable scoped just to the for loop. We are actually declaring it in the for loop right there. Its value updates with the current loop. When we loop to five, we get the values zero through four printed to the screen. That's because computers start their count from zero and it loops five times. We can name the i whatever we want. I'll change it to my num and it has the same effect. You may see i used often in a for loop context used to mean increment. It's just a shorthand for a longer word. The key word to learn here is iteration. This is the act of looping through an object. If we look at the loop below, we can say that we iterate through the value of the variable x. Both loops print identically. The loop below that is iterating through a string variable with the value strang. It prints out the letters individually. We can iterate through more complex things as well. It is a good time to introduce the concept of lists. A list is a collection of values saved as a variable. We can create a list by using the syntax seen here. The list holds four values. We denote a list by placing brackets on each side of the value after the equal sign. This informs Godot that this will be a list and not just a single variable. To separate the values inside the list, we use a comma between the values. When we iterate through the list, we print all the values. Lists are extremely useful when looping. Looping and lists go hand in hand. Let's see the final last loop of this script to understand a little more. Here we are looping through the children of the node holder and printing them to the screen. When we use that function, get children, it means that we are getting the children of that node in a list, and then we loop through that list using the for loop. We are going to do this for our raycast nodes and check for collisions instead of doing this all to them individually. So back to our shotgun script now, all we've done is add this for loop into our fire function. And what this for loop does right here is it is looping through the raycast that we have coming out of the end of our shotgun here. We're then going to check each one uh, for what they're colliding with. That way we can tell if we have hit something when we fired. So going back to the script, we can say for ray holder for ray in rayholder.getchildren, which returns a list of all the children of this ray holder node, which is our raycast. We then check if the individual ray is colliding with anything. If it is, then we're going to print the collider. If it isn't, then we're just not going to print anything. So now we can run this and shoot the ground and see if our raycast hit the ground. But another thing we can do to make it a little clearer is go up here and click the visible collision shapes to on. It'll normally be off, we click it on. We can then run the scene. Sorry, let's run the best level scene. And we see our raycasts that turn red when we are hitting something. So if we fire, we can see down there. Let me bring this up. I don't know if I can. 
but we could see at the bottom these are what we're hitting the static body we're hitting the floor so that would be this static body right here that we were just shooting so for every ray that is colliding with the static body when we press the trigger we're going to get a printout here so what I'm going to do just to demonstrate is to aim at the side here and we'll only get like one printout because we only have one collision maybe even less than that we can see we have a few collisions and then if I aim right in the middle all of them collide so it might be easier to see if we go and shoot something like this we only had a few collisions see some of them only show up a few times and then when we aim directly at the ground we had all eight raycast hit so that's a pretty decent shotgun in my opinion so now we need to make an enemy and we're going to make something similar to this i'm going to go ahead and delete him we need to add and we're going to add a uv sphere what we're then going to do is click over here into the sculpt mode once we are in the sculpt mode we want to turn on this dino topo which will allow us to make more geometry as we sculpt. Let me just quickly turn it off for now and you can see what happens. See all those weird lines we're getting uh, and it makes things difficult to sculpt. Uh, we control Z all that and we go back to Dino Topo. When we move stuff around on our uh, object, it actually adds more geometry to it. So if we grab like this and pull it out, you can see it adds more geometry as it goes. And this is how we can sculpt things in Blender. So we're going to control Z all that. <clears throat> and then we're going to go here. And uh, I'm gonna make a monster similar to what you just saw. So what I'm gonna do is first kind of flatten our cube here. I'm also using the snake hook tool. That's my favorite tool. I pretty much use that for everything. I don't really do a whole lot of modeling though we're just going to make it look pretty decent so now that we have that mouth formation kind of made let's grab some of the kind of lip here and we're going to make like four almost like a, a head crab from uh what do you call it half-life i guess they're like tendril hooks but also for the mouth you know what uh should we do three yeah i think we're just going to do three this time i think that's kind of cool so we got one there, uh, let's undo that. Let's turn this radius down. Let's do one there. And then we're going to bring this one out a little bit. Kind of control Z, let's bring that out like that. So uh, we're actually, I think that will be fine. And what we need to do now is uh, we turn it down maybe like to 50, somewhere in there. We can pull some of these little strands off. We can uh, make an indent for the eye. We can make the indent for the eye over here too. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're just getting a rough estimate for now. All right, so now we can go back to object mode. I'm going to go shade smooth. So we have this sort of shape here, and uh, let's add some eyeballs. So we'll go add, mesh, uh, UV sphere, and I'm going to rotate. So that looks all right. Let's go monster a blender file and then what we can do is grab add 
Uh, let's add a cube. We're going to make that really small. We're going to bring it up just so we can edit it a little bit easier. And what I'm going to do is take it and just make it into a tooth. So we'll say E, bring that up, we'll kind of move that in. When we look at it from the side, we can spin it a little bit and then uh, rotate it, bring it back and do the same and then uh, rotate it a little more, scale it, um, maybe rotate just a little more. We'll do the same thing. And now we have this kind of like fang thing. So we have that and we're going to say object uh, shade smooth and we could make this more detailed but I think that should be okay for now. We're also going to take the bottom and bring it out and then bring that in and bring that out and then bring that in. That makes it look a little more three dimensional. We can also do this and then scale that just a little bit and then put another one here and if we scale that a little bit gives us uh, kind of a weird but nice shape like that. So we can then kind of spin this around and uh, it's a tooth. Oh, sorry, spun it the wrong way. R on the Z, let's go 90, negative. Uh, yeah, bring it down. So we're going to scale it. And then we can kind of add these in. And I'm just pressing Shift D. I mean, there's more efficient ways to do this. You could like create a, uh, what do you call it? Like a curve and then put them all along the curve. But uh, I mean, this is like the fastest way to just slam them in there. All right, so we have our character here. We want to animate him. So what we're gonna do is add some bones. So let's go to add, we'll go to armature, single bone. We'll add that in. We then need to come over here, go to viewport display and click in front. So it displays in, it displays in front of our model. Uh, the next thing we need to do is go switch into the edit mode. And that allows us to edit uh, bones here. So we are going to take this one and move it kind of more towards the back and center of our model, make it a little bit bigger. This is the center bone for our model, which will control its main movement. We are then going to add a single bone to that. We're going to grab this one and these are going to control the mouth. So we'll grab this and bring it over here. What we'll do is then grab this one here and grab the single main bone and we'll hit control P. Then we have to grab it here and here and hit control P and then keep offset. So what that does is make these two linked that when this big one moves, it moves this one as well. However, this one is still going to stay this distance away. They don't have to be connected. So we can then move that right over here and we'll move this inward. Oops, sorry, just meant to grab that tip. Move that in here. And then move that right there. And then, all right, we just need to do that a few more times. I think we can just uh, shift D and copy this. So that's cool. And then what we need to do is once we have that done, let's press A on everything and hit Control A and apply the rotation and scale of every object on our scene. That will save us from running into issues later. We are then going to click on our mesh and then click on our armature and say control P with automatic weights. We'll do the same thing with uh, the eyeballs. 
control P and in the teeth as well, select the mesh, select the bone and print control P with automatic weights. And what this does is it will do its best to map the mesh to the bone. So now if I move the bone around, you can see that the mesh moves with it. And we have these here as well. We can move that. And uh, it's not, you know, it's not perfect, but it does a pretty good job for this little indie project we're doing. So what we're going to do now is start creating animations for our guy. And we might have to adjust how the bones influence things. Let's actually go through and name these bones real quick. So I like to name this one base. Uh, we'll name this uh, right top. Uh, we'll name this one left top. And then this one's just the bottom middle. So there we go. And then we're not going to name these. That would take too much effort. Um, but we can go here into object mode. And if we click on the mesh, or we click on these uh, eyeballs here, which is just another mesh, we can then go to the uh, weight paint option. And we can see how, how much of the influence each bone has on it. So right now we're on the base bone and we can see there's some influence because it's green. If there's no influence, it's all blue. And then if there's a lot of influence, it's red. So let's actually hide our uh, model there. And then we're going to paint all the influence to our base. So as you can see, it's, we have, we're on the draw. We can also subtract, so we could uh, subtract influence, but we're on the bone we want. We want all the influence to be from the base. So let's go back to the add, and we can do that. And we can move around and paint the entire eye so that the entire eye moves only with the base. We can then go through these and go to subtract and remove all influence from the base. And a faster way to paint the entire thing would be to, uh, if you hold Alt and then go up or down, it will start moving across the entire thing in a gradient, the entire uh, object in a gradient. So that is Alt and then pull in a direction. So right now I can Alt pull and that removes all the influence, move back to add, Alt pull and we have all the influence back on our base bone, which is what we want. So let's return now and hit Alt-H to unhide everything. So now, uh, if we do move this bone back here, pretty much everything moves with it. And that is what we want, so that if we rotate this model, then we can rotate these two to make it look like it's biting or whatever. So that's good. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, let's save and we're going to go to the animation um, tab in Blender. And if you've never been here before, it's a fun place. We have our 3D viewport off to the left. We have another one off to the right. And most likely when you come in, you're going to be in the dope sheet. But I like to move it to the action editor. From here, we can start adding new actions. So let's put a rest pose in. Let's just do rest and we'll have maybe the mouth be a little more closed. So let's take a top view and uh, kind of push the lips or tentacles or whatever the fuck you want to call them in a little more. Like that and we'll hit A, and then we'll say I to insert location and rotation. So that creates a keyframe like the one we saw in Godot. And then we're going to maybe move like, uh, I don't know, uh, five frames or so, and we'll just kind of flex these out a little bit. Actually, you know, let's move like 15 frames, and then we're gonna go back and just flex them a little bit so it looks like he's kind of breathing in and out. And maybe kind of move this on the Z a little bit. And then we'll hit A, and then we'll insert location rotation. We're hitting A to select all the bones so we don't have to individually create keyframes for all of them. 
we only keyframe what's selected. So if I hit I here and uh, location rotation, it's only that bone. And then if I hit A, you'll see there's no other little dots showing up for the other bones. So, oops, control Z. And then we can also come down here and delete stuff or we can scale stuff or move stuff with these little dots. So let's uh, do that. Um, we need to expand how long this animation goes on for. And since it's gonna be moving in and out, let's actually take this and we're gonna go shift D and move it around here. And then we're gonna take this one and then shift D and move it around there. And then what we're gonna do this time is come over, we're gonna to scrub to there. And we normally pivot a little bit to the left, but on this one, we're going to pivot to the right instead and say insert location rotation. And then we'll grab the first starting ones here and we'll put them uh, down there. And let's just have all this spread out. We'll make it every 20 frames, make everything even, and we'll see how that looks for a resting pose. So uh, yeah, we can click this button to get rid of all the blender stuff. So now let's just run it. We need to go back to, oh, let me put that in and we'll select everything. We need to go back to about 80. So that would be how it would look at rest. And uh, I don't know, I guess that's okay. Who really, who really cares, you know? We just need to know what it is. It's not, this isn't a, a fucking AAA game. Um, next, we're going to have a hit. Uh, like a damage so let's do like take hit And uh, we have some interesting things happening here, which we can just go ahead and fix. Um, let me make this keyframe, insert location rotation. So um, our mesh is kind of messing up and it's not going with our eyeball. And what's happening is this part of the mesh is actually being pulled by these bones over here when we don't want them to have that much influence on that part of the mesh. Same with up here. So let's adjust that by going back to object mode and then we'll hit weight paint and we can actually click uh, through the bones to see. So the bottom middle has influence all over here and we don't want that. So we're gonna go to subtract and just kind of get rid of that influence. And that should be enough. Um, let's see, the that bone doesn't have any the right top has a lot of influence right there. So I'm sure if we start fixing this, then you start seeing that it comes up a little bit more like what we want. We do want some effect, but very minimal right in that area. So let's just go ahead and fix that up here too. So that's kind of a little more with it. And we never fix this eye. So let's um, go back to object mode, click on that eye. We'll go to uh, weight paint again, and we'll go to the base bone and alt and uh, oh, go to add alt and then drag it back and make sure the entire thing is red. And then we'll go to the other bones, click on the subtract and we'll go through them. And then we'll go alt and pull the other way to make sure they have no influence. So now that's looking better.
ahead and file, export, gltf. We're going to go to our test folder. And we'll make a new folder and call this one um, monster. Go in here and export it. Then we can go back into Godot. Uh, let's go to 3D scene. Let's go to our monster. Bring him in. Let's see what he looks like. So he's purple, which is fine. Uh, we'll make that local. We'll then, uh, I think that should be fine. I just want to see the animations. Okay, yeah, I can't, I can't edit them until I save the scene, but um, they're all here. I just wanted to make sure of that. Cool, and then take hit. We might actually use that as a spit animation, and then we might just use, uh, because I forgot to make that. But anyway, we got our monster. Um, we're gonna start coding him. So after we have completed the blender part, we need to create an enemy scene. Let's make a new scene. Our first node to add will be a character body 3D node, the same type of node we use for our player. Since we have a character body, we need a collision shape. We are going to use the capsule shape again create the capsule shape and leave the parameters where they are. Let's add the GLB to the scene. We can drag and drop and then right click and choose the make local option. This places our GLB in the scene. Normally the transform will be off zero so we can move that back to the zero position. Let's go to the animation editor. If you haven't already saved the scene, do so now. I'm going to call mine monster guy. If we try to loop or edit the animations, we get an error that says can't change loop mode on animation embedded in another scene. To fix this, we just need to close the scene and reopen it again. I'm not sure why this works, but it does. We don't need to close Godot, just that scene. Now when we reopen it, we can alter the animations. Let's loop the byte animation and set it to auto start. The auto start icon is in the animation player near the top. We can only have one auto start animation active on the animation player at a time. Going back to our main scene, we are going to link our monster scene using the chain icon near the top menu. Once our monster is in the scene, we can run and take a look. Our monster will float, but we are going to use the character body being planted on the ground. This way we can code it like a regular walking person and then add a simple animation in Godot to make it look like it's flying and bobbing. So we now have to code behavior for our enemy here. And basically what we're going to do is have our enemy react to the behavior of our player. So we're going to create separate states for our enemy to be in. And then when the player triggers one of those states, we're going to move to it. That's a little abstract. What I mean by that is uh, we'll have our guy here in the rest animation. He'll be resting and all of, her, all of his code will just say, just hang out here. And then we'll have an area around him. And when our player crosses into that area, he won't be in the rest state anymore. He will move into the chase state. So we'll probably play, uh, we'll have to make another animation for him to bob up and down, but he'll be chasing the player in that state. And then when he gets close enough to the player, he will move into the bite state. So that way he will just go ahead and bite the player when he's close enough. And then he'll return to the um, idle state after he's bitten the player. If the player is not dead, he will return to chasing and biting him. So it's all about separating out our logic so they're not all kind of hitting each other at the same time. We don't want all of our code in the same place because then we're going to be running when we should be biting or chasing when we should be resting. We want it all in different functions. And what that looks like script wise is something like this, where we have a physics process right here, which is just a process function. And we looked at that earlier, that's running 60 times a second. Don't worry too much about this right now. Just look at this. 
this is the current state of uh, our monster, whatever our monster in. This is just pseudocode, none of this actually works, but it's just demonstrating a point. But we have our current state, we set it equal to idle, and then if it's in that state, we only run the idle code right here, which prints out we are idle, and it checks for a button press. When that button is pressed, we then move to the chase state. So then we will move on to this function down here, and this code is no longer running, and this code is now running. So we've separated the logic out for these two functions, which is the whole point of what we're trying to do. So now that we are chasing, we could uh, say if we get too close to the player, then byte, then move to the byte function. So that's not what this is, but we could put all of our movement code here and have that lead into another function. And then that's basically how it's done, is we have all of this separated out into different functions here that we're going to run through. And one thing we need to update is when we make ours, we're not going to use an if statement. We're going to use something called a match statement. And what that is, is I can say match current state, and then put our, uh, I think it's what are those parentheses, colons, whatever the fuck they are, and then put that and tab over, and we can do that here. Uh, we just need to put idle, chase, and byte. Oh, sorry, these need to come over. They all need to be indented correctly. So now we just say current state, if it's equal to idle, we do the idle. If it's equal to chase, we go to the chase code. If it's equal to byte, we do the byte code. And uh, the way we're updating it is we have these three variables right here. We have current state, next state, and previous state. And since this runs at 60 frames a second, we take whatever the previous state is and we set it to the current state. So we just saved whatever state we were currently in. We then take the current state and set it equal to the next state. So now we've updated whatever state we are in. And then whatever current state we are in, whatever updated one we're in, we go and move into that code. And so when we want to change states, we change our next state and when we hit the next tick of our physics process, it changes it for us in here, and then we move to that function. So this is a big part of making character controllers and enemies is programming a state machine like this. This is about the simplest one you can make that's useful. You can complicate this as much as you want, but I prefer to just keep it as simple as I can. So we're going to start coding our guy now, and for that we're going to need a script. And what we're going to do is first create an area 3D around our guy, uh, around our monster, so that when the player walks into it, the monster then knows to change to the other state, which is bite. So we're not going to worry about them facing the player or actually being synced up and moving towards the player right now. We're just going to switch two states. It'll be idle and bite. So. Let's create our script here, and we're going to get rid of all of this stuff right here. And I'm going to go back to my example script that I made and copy and paste some code. So I want to grab, we're going to need states again. We're pretty much going to need all of this. So I'm going to control C, and then I'll go back to my monster guy script, and we'll get rid of you. We'll paste that in. So let's get rid of the chase because we're not going to be chasing. And then let's create a idle and a byte func idle pass func byte pass. So now all we're doing is creating our states and then updating our states, uh, but we don't have any code, so it's just gonna stay in the idle state and do absolutely nothing. So let's add a node to our monster that uh, goes around him and checks if the player is near, and that's going to be an area 3D. 
So an area 3D is just an area that checks for if anything collides with it. We add we need to add a collision shape just like just like our monster, it needs a collision shape to exist in the world. So we'll click on this collision shape down here. And we're gonna make this just a uh, might as well make it a box, make it simple. So what we're gonna do is detect our player. If our player enters this box area, then we will change to the byte state. So what we need to do is go here, go to our node, and we say area entered. And uh, body entered is actually gonna be the one we want because our character is a body. This uh, character body 3D is considered a body. So we're gonna go to area 3D, body entered. We're gonna say connect connect it to our monster guy and then that creates a function for us this is a signal and this body right here is the body that is touching our box so whatever touches our box is going to be given to us in the script here so we're going to check if what we're touching is the player by saying if body dot is in group and then we can put in quotation marks here because it's a string player and so then if it is a player we want to execute some logic and that logic will be to say next state equals and uh, we'll change that to byte all right so we just need to change that to byte and we are updating our state to byte whenever we bump into the player so we actually need to go back to our player here and change the uh, groups. We need to add a group. So we just come over here and type player and then we hit add and this little box shows up over here on our player node and then we can see that we are in the player group. So now we can be detected by this if statement right here when our body, our player bumps into us as the monster. So let's add a little bit of uh, functionality to these codes. So we're in idle and all we want to do is simply play the idle animation. So we'll do our dollar sign for get node and then we'll say animation player and that is on our monster node so we can hit enter and then we'll say play and we just want to play the rest animation. And then we can do the same thing here We'll control C and then we'll go to byte, control V and we'll press, well, we'll put in byte there. So if we're in the idle, we're going to be playing the idle animation and if we're in the byte, we're gonna be playing the byte animation. And the frame is being updated every frame. And so let's go ahead and update, uh, let's add another signal on our area 3D. So when our body exits, we go back to idle. So we click on our area 3D sorry, make sure it's selected. Then we go to signals and we say body exited. So whenever something exits our area 3D, it will contact us through the script here. And we're going to take this line, control C, and then uh, put it down here. Oh my gosh, work with me. Uh, right there. And instead of saying bite, we're going to say, idle. So let's give that a shot. I believe we already put our monster into this scene. Uh, if not, let's go ahead. Oh, he's down here. All right. So we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and run it. So we kind of spawned inside the monster's arena, but now when we exit, we can see that we are now outside. We go back in, he goes back to biting. So this is pretty much how we're going to uh, code our behavior for our guy here. Is that when we're close enough, uh, he's going to attack. And then when he's not close enough, he's going to move towards us. So that's as simple as it needs to be. And uh, I don't really want to complicate it too much. Um, we're going to have to add in the movement and the tracking. And that's going to be the hardest part. But then we're pretty much done. I mean, the rest of it's easy stuff. So congratulations.
and we're uh, going to do something here just to make this a little easier for us. We're going to go to our monster guy and click uh, select, uh, add a new a new node, and we're going to say uh, text uh, 3D should be oh um, label label 3D sorry label 3D create it, and we're going to call this state label. Uh, what this does is allow us to put some text in a 3D space. So we're going to drag it above our guy's head here. We can click on that and go to the inspector. And then we're going to say text and we're going to set this equal to something there. Uh, right now it's just a bunch of gibberish. And we've also got to spin it around. Let's go to transform and um, rotation 180. There we go. Now it's facing the right direction. So uh, we want to update this whenever our state changes. And the way we can do that is by coming in here and saying if previous state is not equal to current state. So if we just had a change of our current state, because otherwise these two would be in sync, then we are going to update the text of our state label. So we can say state label and then we say dot text, which is uh, this property here, which just dot text. So then we can set that equal to whatever we want, and we're going to set it equal to the value of current state. So now if we run our scene again, it makes it a little more clear. Let me lower our guy down uh, a little bit. about right there. So we can see that now he's in the idle state and as soon as we go in he's in the bite and then back to idle. So that makes it a little bit easier to see. And that also is a trick if you only want to run code one time within a uh, when you enter a state. If you want to run code as soon as you enter a state. So let's say I want to run code one time and one time only when I enter the idle state. If I hit this here and say print and it says uh, I'm idle once, that's good. And the problem is if I do a print statement here, it will always be idling. So I'm going to say always idle. And you'll see what I mean. So we run this again. And we just need to get out of here so he goes into the idle state. And then if we exit out, we can come down here. And since that's running 60 frames a second right there, uh, it's printing out always idle a ton of times. But I'm idle once, only printed once, because we only change to this state one time while we're in it. So usually it's good practice to not have stuff running a ton of times. Um, so what we're going to do is move this animation over just so that it only plays once and we're not constantly playing the animation 60 times a second. So we're going to do that for this down here as well. And that may cause our animation to not play as well because we need to loop it. Because now it's only going to play the animation once, not 60 times a second. But our animation is already looped, so we should be okay to go. Uh, yeah. So now our bite should only play once. Let's give that a try. So that time it went into bite and it only played it once because it's not constantly playing that animation. Whereas if we go to idle because that animation is looped, it's just going to keep looping over and over again. But now we go back into byte one quick time and then it's done. So that's how you control something running multiple times and running one time. Oh my. my cursor was still stuck there. But yeah, so adding that check statement to make sure it's uh, we're coming from a different state. So let's start adding in the navigation so our 
uh, Monster can start finding us. What we're going to do is go to our best level and then we're going to click add. We're going to add a navigation region 3D. This creates a region for our enemy to walk around in. And we do that by baking the mesh. But first we need something to bake to. So if we look at this, a navigation mesh resource must be set or created for this node to work. So if we say new navigation mesh, we now need to make some stuff for it to navigate around. And we use the meshes that we brought in from Blender. I'm going to use the standing plane and the buildings because those are the only two things the character, I mean, the enemy really has to watch out for. Uh, they can't bump into the building and they can only walk on the standing plane. So I'm going to take those two meshes and move them into the navigation region. It only works with meshes. It does not work with static bodies or collision shapes. They have to be meshes. So then we grab our navigation region and we can actually, let's hide all that stuff for right now. So once we press the navigation region and we have those two meshes there, we're going to hit fake nav mesh. And that creates this uh, nice blue area. And this is where our enemy can walk. So our enemy can walk anywhere where these meshes exist. And then we're going to have our player as a target. And what it's going to do is create a list of positions um, following our player around and then we'll feed those positions to our monster to have him follow. So it sounds complicated, but it's not that bad. So we go back to our monster guy now and we actually need to add a node to him. We need to add a nav, uh, I believe it's navigation agent 3D right there. So we're going to create that and all we just have to do is have this guy here and then we're going to reference him through code. So I guess we'll go ahead and jump on into the code now. All right, so I have the navigation going now. I'm going to demonstrate it. So we have the guy following us, our monster, and you can see he's in the chase state, which is another state we created, and we'll, demo, we'll show how it works in a second. When he gets too close, we move to the bite, and then he stays there until we move away, and then he's in the chase again. Now he's just moving to follow us. He doesn't rotate to uh, face us or anything like that. We can fix that later. And he can follow us uh, anywhere that our navigation region 3D that we baked earlier is. So he couldn't follow us over there, but we would also fall through. And if we do fall down, he just kind of hovers there. But let's uh, see how we made that work. So there's our navigation region 3D that we baked earlier. We need that. It communicates with this node here, the navigation agent 3D. Going to our code now, we had to do a few things. The first thing we had to do was get a reference to our player. And we create an on ready var here to have a global variable called player that we can access anywhere. We then on our ready function, so when this node enters the tree, we get a reference to the player. Uh, we use the function get tree, which gets the tree that holds all of our scenes. And then we say get first node in group. And when we made our node uh, player over here, when we added it to the group player, it is the only node in that group. So when we run this level, it's gonna go to the scene tree, which is the node above this that holds everything. And then it's going to say, get me the first uh, first node that's in the group player. And player is the only node. So it's going to return that one every time as long as it's there. If it's not there, it will cause an error. So you need to make sure you have at least one node in that group. So then if we print it out, since we already ran the scene, we can see it down here. Uh, that's the name of the node. And then this is the actual ID of the node. So now that we have our player, we're going to give that to our navigation agent and tell it to target that. But uh, first we have to call our um, chase function. So we have this chase state right here. And when that's entered, we enter the chase function. And since it has to do with movement, we're going to need the delta variable, which we just pass in because we're already in the physics process function. 
So we get down to chase here and uh, we take <clears throat> our navigation agent and condense that into a variable because we don't have to, we don't want to have to write this out every single time. And we are taking our velocity, which is a built-in variable from our character body 3D and setting that equal to the next path position of our navigation agent minus our current position. Uh, we normalize that and then multiply it by speed and delta. And all this is irrelevant. That's just to uh, sync it up to the frame rate. Don't worry too much about that. But this is what we really need to focus on. This is two vector threes being subtracted. And that gives us basically the, the path towards our next position. And so what we do is if our distance from our player is greater than one unit away from ourselves, this position is our ourself right here. We could even say, you know, self dot position that would run too. But so we're checking the distance from the player and ourselves. And if it's greater than one, then we're going to update the navigation's target position to the new position of the player because this runs 60 times a second. And then we're going to move and collide. So that will just move us towards the player. So that's only if we're um, greater than one unit away. If we were like on top of the player, we would stop advancing toward them, towards them. Otherwise we would get an error. But so all of that combined will allow us to follow the player. And this is vector math. It's kind of complicated. Uh, you can look up um, subtracting 3D vectors. It's interesting, but I would just, you know, uh, there's a lot of tutorials showing you how to do this. So I don't remember it every single time. I usually look it up. I also forgot to mention that we are entering the chase state from the idle state with pretty much no logic. We're just telling it to jump into the chase state. Uh, I just did that for simplicity's sake. We probably won't use the idle animation at all because there's really no time when our enemies are going to be idle. They're always going to be uh, chasing us. So um, the next thing that we need to do is uh, really flesh out our monster and make sure that we can hit them and they can hit us. So let's add a collision shape. Uh, actually, let's add an area, area 3D. And this is going to be the actual body for the monster. Let's add a collision shape 3D on there. And let's say this uh, monster hit detection. And then we'll call this um, hit collision. Hit collision. All right, there we go. And let's go back to our inspector here. We're going to make this one a sphere shape. And it is going to be attached to the monster mesh. And then we'll move it up. And then, of course, we're going to have to grab the hitbox and make it a little bit bigger. We're going to make it just a little bit bigger than the actual object here. Uh, that way, the player doesn't feel cheated if they shoot pretty close to it but don't hit it. I think that's a good way to go. And uh, you know what we're also going to do, which I think is cool, is we're going to add a critical area to the eyeball over here. So let's um, add here, we're going to add another area, area 3D, and then we're going to hit it again and add a collision shape. And then we're going to call this uh, eye crit. And then um, we can actually, we don't really have to rename this one. It's going to be on the eye crit. So we're going to know what it is. Uh, and let's make that a sphere as well. And let's make sure to make it a child of the monster um, GLB import thingy. And then we're going to move the area 3D, move the whole thing up to, I would say, right here. And uh, yeah, I don't think we're gonna do it for that eye. We're just gonna do it for this one. And then if it works, we'll duplicate it and figure it out. Figure it out, dude. Uh, we're gonna go to monster hit detection. We're gonna go to node um, signals. And uh, actually no, because our shotgun is gonna tell us what we collide with. So 
let's just put this into a group actually let's go to groups and we'll put this into group um, enemy and then we're going to put this one into group uh, critical critic call all right so let's go back to our shotgun now and we'll go back to this script and this is where we hit uh, where are we checking for the hit scans fire where are you at okay if ray is colliding print ray dot get collider all right so now we can do this um, if ray dot get collider that is in group and then we can write separate logic so so if it is in the group enemy we'll say uh, uh, ray dot get collider and then we can call a function here. So what we're gonna do is say, uh, take damage. And we'll just give it an arbitrary amount of damage. We'll say 10, we'll give the enemy 100 points to start with. And then we're gonna do the exact same thing. So we can copy and paste, slam that down here. And then this time it's gonna say, if enemy is in group crit, uh, or do we call it critical? Yeah, I think we call it critical. So then we'll do 25 damage instead of 10. So let's see how that plays out. So, uh, all right, so now we need to go to our get collider, which is our enemy, and we need to make sure they have this function take damage and it takes an argument. So we're going to control C to save that, go to our monster guy, and then we're gonna hit a new function. Let's actually leave those variables right there and create this function right here. Take damage, and we'll just say num. We're getting a num. We're going to print, um, and we'll say we took uh, num damage, damage. That way we know how much damage we took and we'll add some health bars and some shit later. But um, yeah, so whenever we shoot our monster guy, it should print this out. So yeah, let's give that a try. Yep. We're going to go ahead and run it. Oh, okay, so I think uh, we're not colliding with areas with our, um, we're only colliding with bodies. So we need to change that. We need to go to, sorry, it's probably confusing. We need to go to our shotgun and we need to go to our ray holder and check out our rays and go to our inspector. And right now it's only colliding with bodies. So on our monster guy, it's colliding with our monster guy's body but it's not colliding with these because these are areas. So we need to go back to our player and go to our, uh, sorry, go to our shotgun and then go through these ray casts and say collide with areas as well. We could do this through code, but you know, I don't want to overcomplicate it for everyone. And this makes it very visually understandable what we are doing let's give it a try now we'll save that go to best level run that shit and then if we turn around let's see is that working uh oh non-existent function take damage and base area 3D.
Oh, yeah. Uh, it's trying to call. That makes sense. So right now we are trying to call uh, this node right here and we don't have any functions on this node right here. So let's just, um, there's a few ways we could go about this. So we could actually add a script right here. This is a, you know, this will show you how you can pass variables between scripts and we'll get rid of all this. We'll say func take damage and then we'll, uh, say num here and then we're actually going to say uh, get parent dot get parent so what this does is we're this node right here we're going to get our parent the monster and then we're going to get our parent the monster guy and that has the function that we need so then we just pass on the function take damage num and so we can actually copy this just control C and we'll go down to I crit as well press uh, scripts we're gonna get rid of everything in here control V control save control s I mean and uh, now we should be good to go and um, let's actually take the shotgun and our shotgun does not need to collide with bodies so let's take this off Alright, so there we go, um, because we're only going to be shooting at areas, and the bodies are only for contact of the environment and shit. So now we can see that we are lighting up when we get on the circles, but not down here. So, are we hitting him? We gotta have to shoot him a few more times, I feel like. So, no, I don't think so. I'm not sure what's going on. Let's go back to our shotgun. Collide with areas. Let's go to print and say here. And then we're going to copy that and put it over there as well. Yeah, there we go. I think when I'm shooting it forward right here, oh, that's what's happening. Okay, so yeah, the uh, this is an area 3D, um, so that is eating up all of our input. I'm pretty sure if I turn this off right here, which is what we're gonna do, we're gonna get rid of that. Uh, that was just for demonstration. We can turn this back on and we go here. And now we can... Uh, See, oh, I guess it, I guess it doesn't actually turn it off. You know, let's just go back to Monster Guy, and we're going to take this here, and delete it. And then where we have the, this one, we can uh, go ahead and get rid of that function because we're not going to be using it anymore. So let's, um, yeah, let's go ahead and run. Now we can see that we have critical damage as well as regular damage. Yeah, that other area 3D was eating all of our input, so it was taking all the bullets before they could uh, hit anything. So, yeah, there we go. So we have a, another issue, and that is that our guy chases us, but he doesn't face the rotation that our character is... Um, running in they should be facing us so they can bite us or spit on us at all times 
So let's fix that. We go to our script. Let's go to our monster guy. Um, we'll go up here. And what we're going to do is actually add a new node here. And it's just going to be a basic node 3D. And we're going to call it uh, face direction. And then what we are going to do is uh, say that face direction. And we're going to use a function called look at. And that takes a position. And the position we're going to give it is the character's position, I mean, the player's position. So player dot position. And then we also have to give it a vector to tell it which way is up. So we're just going to say vector three dot up. And we can look at this function to see how it works. But um, basically all you have to do is give it a thing to look at and then tell it which way the world is facing up. So that's what we've done here. And then that means that this node, the face direction node, is going to perpetually face our player whenever this code runs in the chase. So now what we need to do is update our rotation on our um, actual monster guy to face the player and not just this face direction node. So let's go ahead and say rotate on the Y and then we're going to use the deg to rad that we've seen before. It just transfers degrees to radians. We're going to do face, uh, sorry, we're going to do uh, face direction dot rotation dot Y and we're going to multiply that by turn speed which is a variable we have to create and let's just put that up here. Uh, and this will allow us to turn faster or slower. And let's set it at, um, I think 0.3. Let's try 0 0.3, see how fast that is. So if we run this now, it should work. We just added these two lines, uh, uh, these two lines right here. Let's go ahead and give that a go. So is it, it is rotating to face us just very slowly. So let's up the turn speed to uh, two. Maybe that's too fast, but you know, So now, yeah, now it's turned to face us at all times. That's pretty cool. So that's uh, pretty good. Now we just have to add some logic back in to make it bite. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we already have the um, answer kind of looking at us in the face here. So if we're close enough to the player to make a stop, we just have to grab this right here and let's just grab that line control C control V and let's say if we are within is less than two units then we will go into the next state equals byte And then when we're in the byte state, uh, let's go to our animation player um, on our monster guy. We need to get out of the byte state, so we need a way to do that. And the way to do that is once our byte animation ends, we'll send a signal. So we'll go to our node, signal, um, animation finished. We'll connect that to our monster guy. And then we'll say, uh, we'll use a match statement. We're going to match anim name and we'll close this real quick. And let me just uh, put byte and then we'll put our logic in here. And so then we want to say next state and we'll set that equal to chase. 
So after we do the bite, we go back into chase on the animation finished. Let's uh, see if that works. I'm going to turn off the visible collision shapes. And uh, yeah. So let's see how close do we have to get before he bites. Pretty close. Uh, let's turn that up a little bit on Monster Guy. I think he is going to the bite. I don't know. I couldn't really see it. Um, let's go back. And so that's within... If our distance to the player is less than 2, so let's go less than 4. Uh, actually, let's go less than 5. Less than six. Okay, cool. So we're getting there. Um, we'll probably be at what? What do you think? Four? Two more units closer. That way he's munching on her face. Yeah, see, then we're actually getting hit by it. And I think we do need to lower the enemy down just a little bit. Let's go to our monster guy, 3D. Right here, uh, I believe that we can just lower the whole monster down, maybe right there. I think maybe up just a little right there. Let's uh, run that scene now, see how that looks. Yeah, I think that looks a little more reasonable. And then comes in for the bite. All right. So uh, next thing to do is start kind of adding stuff like um, let's go ahead and add a blood spray. We're going to add particles. We're going to do actually, you know what? We're going to make the particles a separate scene. We'll go here, uh, make a new scene. And we're going to say particles. Um, let's go GPU. GPU particles. We're going to go to the inspector and we're going to, uh, oh, we don't need to add anything else. We're going to click on these and then we have to make new draw passes. I'm going to use a, uh, let's use just a sphere mesh. We might as well. And then a process material. We're going to new particles process material. We're going to add the gravity. It can actually stay where it is. The emission shape is what type of shape they come out of. So we're going to change that to a sphere. And I think what we're going to do is set some initial velocity on them. Uh, much less than that, maybe 10. Make sure this is 10 too. And then the direction we're going to, I think, set to 1 should be straight up. Because we want it to come straight up like a blood spurt. And we're going to change this to, let's go like 40. And we're going to come down here and change the material to a new standard material. And we'll make it, uh, let's just make it red. Make it blood red. And we can even go to our um, thing here. Let's make these smaller. Those are going to be like blood droplets, I think, right there. And then we can decrease the segments because we don't need that much definition on them. Oh, let's go with 16 or something. That's fine. And uh, yeah, let's save this as blood spray enemy. All right. So then we're going to change this to blood spray as well. Okay, so we're going to go back up to the time. We'll set the time to three seconds. And then we're also going to add explosiveness to one and one shot to on. So it only emits one time. We're then going to add a script to this. And we'll create that. And we're also going to add a, another node and that's going to be a timer. And what we want to do is we don't need any process. We just need the ready function. When the 
node enters the scene, we're actually going to start the timer. And when the timer is done, we're going to delete the node. So we just have that one little spurt of blood and then the, uh, the node deletes itself. So it's not taking up any more resources. So let's go to our timer and click on the node, go to timeout and connect it to the script. And so then all we have to do here is type in uh, Q free and that is going to delete whatever node this is. This is the same as saying self if you just leave it there. <clears throat> so it's going to delete itself, which will be the blood spray node. So now we just need to spawn this whenever um, we get shot. And we do that by adding this in as a variable to our scene. We can add a lot of things in as variables. So on ready var, and we'll call this blood spray. We're going to say equals, and then we're going to say preload, which is a function. And then we can select whatever we want to preload. In this case, I want to uh, do this whole scene. So I'm going to drag that in right there. So that's how it looks. And that means we're going to preload this scene. And now we have to instance it. All right, so let's go ahead and instance the blood spray scene whenever we get hit. So let's go to the take damage function. And then we want to say uh, bar blood equals blood spray dot instantiate. And then we'll say uh, add child blood. So what we do is we create a variable called blood and we instantiate that from the scene that we preloaded earlier, which is our blood spray scene. We have to instantiate it to make it real. And then we have to add it somewhere in our scene. So we add it as a child of the monster guy node. And so I'm not sure where it's going to spawn on the monster, but let's uh, go ahead and give this a try. So now when we run the scene, when we shoot our monster, we should get some blood spray. Or maybe not. Okay, let's uh, go back to our monster guy. So we are for sure taking that damage. Let's try blood.emitting equals true. And then we will fire it off. Oh. There we go. So now it's emitting from where the base of the node is right there from the very bottom. But that's pretty cool. So what we're going to do is actually just change the position that it's emitting from. So to do that, we just have to add an offset to the uh, position of the blood. So we're going to say var offset. And uh, oh, sorry. And that's going to say equal vector 3. And we're going to do 0. Uh, let's go maybe five and then zero. So then we're going to say blood dot position plus equals offset. And let's see how that works out for us. Oh, I misspelled position. Well, we should be able to click here. Position, not position. In.
so a little too high. So let's go three. Yeah, so now it's erupting out of the uh, our guy there. So now we can start adding in UI for our player and our enemy. So next we are going to start making some UI for our player. That's a user interface, basically our HUD. Heads up display, what we're going to be seeing when we play the game. Because right now we have no idea how much ammo we have or how much health we have. We don't even have a crosshair. So we're going to fix some of those issues. So let's go to the player scene. We're going to be clicking on the camera node, uh, clicking the plus sign to add a node. We're going to add a new control node. And control nodes are what you're going to use when you want to make UI. And when we click on our control node, it brings us into the 2D mode. So we're going to be in the 2D mode creating this thing, and you won't be able to see it really anywhere in our 3D view until we run the game. So it's a, a little annoying, but uh, it's easy to understand once you start going. So the way that Godot decides how big this control node is going to be is it uses these anchors. And we can go up here and select how we want these anchors to be aligned. I am, here we go, anchor presets. I'm going to do full, uh, full rect. So it's going to get the entire camera. And now we can start adding nodes onto here. I'm going to add uh, a label. And I'm going to add a, another label. And then I'm also going to add a texture. So this allows us to add images, and this allows us to add text. So we'll go to this label here and write, um, this should be our health. So for right now, we're just going to type health in there. This is going to be our ammo, and then this will be our current gun. So we're just going to call this current weapon. Maybe we could actually spell it right. All right, and I think this one was health, and then this one was ammo. And then we can go in and move them where they should be. So we're going to have our weapon over here, our ammo over there, and then our health is going to be down over here to the side. So we'll call this player UI. And now we can basically make references to these in our player script and then update them whenever we need to change stuff. So we'll go to player and uh, let's make a new variable called health at on ready var health. And we're just going to set it equal to 100 for now. And we're going to create a function update health. And we'll just put pass until we bring it down. Uh, let's actually, we need to create another on ready var, on ready var, and we'll call that uh, health label. And uh, yeah, we're going to set that equal to, let's add our um, dollar sign, and we want to set it equal to player. UI on our camera 3D. Yeah, uh, no, we want to set that equal to one more tab over and then we'll say health. So there we go. And then we're going to, so how's this going to work? I guess we're going to take damage. So we need a take damage function in here. Let's close that up. Close up the input function as well. So we need a func take damage. And we're going to do the same thing that we did with the uh, enemy where we just pass in num. And then we're going to say health 
minus equals num and we'll do if uh, if health is equal to or less than less than zero then print whoops we are dead nice so that'll just alert us if we're dead assignment is not allowed in the expression what do you mean I guess I have to put the equal sign over here yeah that makes sense I guess I'm an idiot um, <clears throat> all right so take damage and then we're going to say update health and then all we're gonna do here is set our health label dot text equal to uh, we need to get our um, health but this is a number and we need it to be a string so we do this str and we wrap it in that and that will convert it to a string so instead of it being an integer it's a string that way it goes in the text field we can't put a integer into a text field so that covers our health and then uh, eventually we'll have a function for um, uh, heal player and we'll just do the same thing basically um, health plus equals num update health so now we can come up with some type of like med pack or something put that in the game and then whenever the player crosses into the path with it we'll just run this function and that will update our health all right so now we can start thinking about our shotgun with our player because if we look at what we have uh, we have to update our health and I mean we have to update our ammo and our current weapon here on our player scene but our shotgun is going to be a different scene sometimes it might not even be loaded on our player so the way we're going to address that is by adding this camera holder into a group uh, well actually we can just do it here we're gonna call this uh, cam we'll just call it cam why not and you can see over here now it's in a group and then on our shotgun here we can actually call that group so what we're going to do is create a function and that's going to be update ammo and uh, I guess we really don't need to pass in anything here. We just need to say get tree dot call group. And the group we're going to call is cam. And then we need the method or the function we are trying to call on that group. So we haven't made that yet. So let's go back to our uh, cam. And we'll say funk um, what are we gonna call this one this will be update ammo update ammo and we'll have a number that we'll pass in and then we'll get uh, we'll just do a real quick um, get node uh, we need to get node ammo there we go and then we're going to set the text equal to a string from the word, I mean from the int num. So this is gonna be a number, pass it in, make it a string, and then set it equal to the value, set the value equal to the text. Set the text equal to the fucking value, sorry. All right, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that'll do. We just need to go back and complete our function here. Uh, we called it update ammo and um, we need to pass in uh, what do we need to pass in um, ammo in gun yeah 
yeah, we need to make the method update ammo uh, or the function or whatever you want to call it. We need to put it into string form and then we need to tell it what it's what group it's calling. Uh, all this does is call the group and then execute the function you put here and then you can pass in your arguments here. So I like to do that. Uh, I think it's a good way to communicate between nodes. So whenever we update our ammo, uh, we also need to do the same thing. Control C. Well, actually, you know, we can just pass in two arguments here. Uh, ammo in inventory. I believe we can do that. Or maybe we should do it this way. We need to put a comma in between these and then put this into a list. So now we are passing in a list that contains the ammo in our gun and the ammo in our inventory. And we're passing that to the camera holder up here into this function. And uh, we'll call this num list. We have to change this around a little bit. Num list. Um, that's not correct. Uh, num list zero. That'll be the first index in the num list. And then we also need to we need to create a, another one, uh, another label. So we're going to call this ammo. No, sorry, label create this will be uh, inventory inventory ammo we can um, add another one here we're going to put the inventory ammo and we'll say dot text equals and we're going to do num list one So, yeah, that should do it. We're passing in the list here. We'll just print that out when we do it. So let's see if that actually works. Oh, that's right, I never actually updated the ammo. So now we need to update the ammo whenever we reload or do anything. So um, after we fire, I guess all the ray, all the way, uh, we can just put it right here. Update ammo, and at the bottom of reload, we'll say update ammo. And um, yeah, that should be it because we have one on fire and one on reload. So we should be good to go. Yeah, I can't set it. Ah, we forgot to do this, str. There we go. Now we have two rounds, one round, zero. Reload, and now we have three, two, one, zero. We reload, and uh, way up there in the left hand corner is our inventory. So let's um, fix that up just a little bit. We need to go to our player UI. Uh, let's go to our inventory ammo. We're going to bring that. Bring that down here. And then our current weapon. And what we're actually going to do with this is take pictures of our uh, weapons in Blender and then use those as our uh, image to go in here because we can put whatever texture we want in here. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so let's get the images from Blender. So let's uh, close this down and we're going to open Blender. I already have one open, so we'll see if my computer handles having two open. And then we're going to go to, uh, let's go to our, uh, where's our shotgun? 
yeah, shotgun, there we go. And we're going to add a camera. And then we'll press O to go to the camera. Oh, we already had a camera. <clears throat> Never mind. Uh, let's delete that camera. Uh, I'm going to press G on the Y. G on the Y to bring our camera back. Or we can press N. Go to view, camera to view. And then now we can move our camera. Um, I'm going to press N get rid of that panel. And I would like to go here. We're going to make this transparent by clicking this transparent in the uh, render tab under film. You got to click transparent. And now if we go here and we go to rendered, you can, uh, let's just G, Z, move that up out of the camera view. And let's see, how big do we want this to be? That would be huge. Let's just go with... Um, 300 by uh, it's 50 that sound good yeah okay uh, maybe less than that yeah let's go 200 by 50 G on the Z just gonna bring our camera up just a little bit and uh, yeah let's render that image oh we still have Alt H, this in the background, G, Z, I'm going to bring that up. Then we can render our image. So that looks all right. Uh, image, save, and let's go to our documents. Uh, I believe from scratch. Uh, shit, I forgot where the fucker thing is at. Test project, assets, level, whatever. Um, oh, that's right, we have a weapons thing. All right, now we're gonna go shotgun.png, save as image. We can jump back into Godot. If we click down here and go to weapons, and we should have shotgun PNG. We can then drag that into our texture there. So that's what we're gonna see. Let's just uh, run the game and see how that looks. Uh, run this game, see how that looks. Okay, cool, so we have our shotgun down there. Let's go ahead and do that with the other guns. So, go file. Well, I won't show you guys that part, it's stupid, um, but yeah. We have the main components of our UI. Now we just need to switch the guns out. So let me make two other guns. All right, so I have the other weapons in now and we can take a look at them. So the first one is this uh, little Derringer 22 pop gun. And it loads uh, one round at a time. We can shoot the enemy with it. We can uh, go up. We already saw our shotgun. Uh, we're calling it the boomstick. We have our Mac 10. And this is actually automatic, so we can hold it down. And then uh, we can reload, and it remembers our ammo between um, changing weapons. We have our Glock, so we can reload that as well. And then uh, we're back to our 22 pop gun, and you can see we're still down the three ammo that we shot at the beginning. Same with the uh, shoot and scoot. So. We have an ammo system, we can change guns, and uh, all the guns can do damage to our enemy. So, uh, I'm gonna go over them kind of briefly because they all work about the same way as our shotgun did. So our shotgun has, let's take a look. If we just condense these down, we only have the process function, which takes our input, just uh, you know, whenever we press the fire and stuff like that, tells us if we can fire or not. And then we have the reload, which reloads our gun, the fire, which fires our gun, the update ammo, which just calls our um, UI on our player. Uh, it updates the ammo count down here. So if we go back to our shotgun, uh, yeah, so that's all that does, and then this just alerts alerts uh, whenever our animation finishes, and this moves our 
um, pretty much drives our shotgun. So that helps us change uh, back into like reloading and stuff like that. So that we're using that exact same animation driven process on uh, pretty much all these, the Mac 10, uh, same thing. We can see we have the reload, fire, update ammo, and then whenever the animation finishes, we just get to shoot again. The thing is the animation on this one, the fire animation is super short, only like one second long. Uh, I mean 0.0, .0 a tenth of a second long. So we can fire much faster than the animation of the shotgun, which is, uh, let's see, one second long. And the Glock is uh, about the same. We have um, the process, take the input, the reload, the fire, update ammo, and the same thing. And the only difference we have in the Derringer script is that we have this add initial ammo, which just adds ammo to our gun um, initially because this is going to be the first gun we have, the 22 pop gun. We're going to start with that gun because it's like, um, you know, kind of a starter weapon type deal. The next thing we did that we have to address is we can see our enemy here when I shoot him he goes into a recoil state uh, we've added that because he also moves backwards a little bit so we've added that to make it a little more um, you know it's just more fun uh, so let's take a look at what we did to our monster guy we'll go here basically what we've done is add a another um, add another state. So we have this recoil state here, and we basically take the opposite of the direction we were moving in in the chase state and go that way. That's all this does. If we look at the chase direction, um, we have the next path position that we get, and then we subtract our position uh, to get where we want to go towards the player. So if we reverse that by adding a negative sign, we'll move away from the player. So whenever we're shot, we move into these, uh, this recoil state and that will launch us backwards. And we, uh, we switch to the recoil state when we take damage. So this is the function that we're actually calling when the ray cast hits the, um, the monster. So we have that flinch sound that we added. Then we say next state recoil, which moves us into here. We come from the chase state to the recoil. We jump backwards because of this line. And then we just play uh, we play the recoil animation, which we added to our monster, which I think I just like made him look up or something. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, I just kind of tipped him up a little bit, so no big deal there. We've also added a sound to our... Um, our monster here but you've already seen how to add audio players so uh, you should know how to do that and uh, yeah I guess we'll continue on so just thinking about what we needed in a weapon system we needed to be able to purchase weapons off the wall with points from killing enemies and then have the player be able to switch through all those weapons so we're gonna be starting off with our little derringer pistol here and the way I did that is by going to our player and instead of like we were doing linking it through here or uh, instantiating it through there, we're actually instantiating it through code. So our player script on our player node uh, up here at the ready function, this is where we actually instantiate our Derringer from a packed scene that we preload. And so then when we want to change guns, we actually are using um, this script down here. I put the input call here, that way we can kind of separate it out from our player and make it easier to uh, debug. So what we have is if event is action pressed, uh, change weapon up. This is a new um, event action that we added, uh, change weapon up. I didn't do it on camera, sorry, but it's uh, the mouse wheel up. We already showed how to add these. So whenever we scroll the mouse wheel up, we'll change weapons up, just cycle it up like any normal FPS. We then have our weapon list, and this is the weapons that the character will have available to them. So if I go in here and put Mac 10, then we will be able to switch to the Mac 10. So right now we just have Derringer, uh, Shotgun, and 
Mac 10, but we don't have the Glock. So if I go back in here now and say Glock, we run that again. I can switch one, two, three, right to the problem solver or the Glock. So that's how we're going to control what our character has. When we start off, we're only going to have just the Derringer. And then as we buy stuff off the wall, we're going to add it in here. So we'll just add this string in. And that's really all we have to do with this pickup weapon function. We're going to call this from um, whatever node we want whenever we like step on the weapon to pick it up or buy it. We'll just call this function, send in whatever we want. So we could say shotgun. It'll say weapon list dot append that adds it to the end of our list. So we'll have shotgun added there and then we can switch to it. So um, the actual cycle weapon up function is right here. <clears throat> the first thing that we do is get the current weapon and we get that by checking our first child. Since we are the weapon holder, our only child should be the weapon that is currently being used by the player. So when we get when we get that first node that is our get children gets us a list of our nodes and then we get the first node in that list and then we say get the name of that node. So we had our Derringer, it'll return Derringer. We had shotgun, it'll return shotgun. So then we check if that gun can fire because this whole thing is going to be cycling our weapon to the next weapon and if we're reloading or firing, we don't want to be able to switch weapons. We then get the index on the list that we are currently at using the find function. So if we were the Derringer coming in, uh, we had that equipped, we would be at index zero. We would then check to make sure that we're uh, not out of bounds or we don't have a negative index. And then we also check to make sure that we don't have uh, we're not going over so like if we were on shotgun instead of going to index number two that doesn't exist We flip back over and go to Derringer. That's what that line down there does and Right here when we switch the guns out We actually need to record the ammo count for the gun So let's say we have the shotgun and we shoot three rounds and then reload and we have uh, whatever five rounds left or whatever in the inventory we need to record that and we're recording that in this dictionary up here. So these are the initial amount of rounds each um, gun will get. Three rounds in the gun for the shotgun and six rounds for your um, inventory. For the MAC-10, 30 in the gun and 60 for the inventory and so on and so forth. So when we save them, we save how much ammo is in the gun and how much ammo is in the inventory. And we save it to these values in this dictionary. So we can call upon those values whenever we need them. And uh, we just call this function down here. We could have had all this written into here, but it's easier just to call the function and then send in the values. We can use get children, uh, dot name and get children dot ammo and gun because we all, <laughs> because they all have that, um, this variable in, uh, in them. So if we go to our Mac 10, you know, we have ammo and gun. If we go to our Derringer, ammo and gun. And we go to our Glock, it's ammo and gun. So they all have this variable that is updated whenever they are reloaded or being shot. So we can always check that variable to get their ammo count. So that is what we do be ever, uh, before we um, queue free the previous gun and load in the next gun. And that is where we queue free it right here. And so then we have to spawn our new gun. So the return index is gonna be whatever our current index is plus one, unless we have to loop back around. And so if we, uh, once we get the return index, we're gonna spawn the new gun. And um, here we have another match statement where we are checking our weapon list. We're getting that index. So right now, if we were the Derringer and we pressed up, our return index would be one because we are at index zero. Return index would be one. That would be our shotgun. We will come down here, go to our shotgun, and uh, I'll demonstrate it here just because I have uh, all of the code. This part updates our UI to tell us you know, what um, gun is currently equipped, all that stuff down here. 
This uh, actually creates the instantiation of the gun. This adds it as a child to our node, um, basically adding it to ourselves, this node right here. The gun uh, right here is where we are, we're setting the ammo that is in the gun and the ammo that is in the inventory from our dictionary. So if we saved it previously here, now it's going to be returned uh, to this value here because we have it saved. And then we update the ammo, which is the function um, that just updates the UI. So it should say update ammo UI, but it just says update ammo. All it does is call and tell how much uh, ammo is, should be on the screen for the player. Sorry, that was badly named. <clears throat> Let's go back. Um, the Derringer offset, this just gives it a little bit of offset so it sits better for the player to see. And we just change the position. So that's all we do um, is to update the UI, instantiate the scene, add the scene as a child, uh, update the ammo that's in the current gun, and display that to the player, and then set the position of the gun where it should be. So we do that for every gun down here, and that's what the match statement does, uh, is we'll <laughs> it will uh, set us up for whichever gun we pass in. So that is how we did all of our logic for the uh, weapon holder. All right, so we're really at a point now in the game where um, uh, I've showed you pretty much how to code a lot of stuff, and most of it is now just fleshing out the game. We're not really adding a whole lot of new mechanics. Uh, the only thing that I've... I've done a lot of work um, away from the uh, video, but most of it has been just me changing up the environment and changing up some of these textures to make everything look better. Uh, I used AI uh, Bing Image Creator to make these textures. I'll just pull that up real quick. So uh, you basically can just type in like space station seamless wall texture and uh, use one of these or you know um, I did like some food stuff because uh, I have these like rotating things that just display images um, that are pretty cool so I just AI generated some stuff uh, for that and put those in there this monster guy I made in blender and it's very easy if you know how to do curves you just basically make a bunch of curves for tentacles and then um, add some bones and have them flail all over the place just like we did for our other character you parent the bones to them and uh, yeah we then import them as a scene all that stuff just like we did our enemy um, I had to change up the navigation a little bit I had to change the size and the height of the cells as well as the agents uh, the agents are the things that are actually moving around in the world and the cells are the cells that they move in. So I just had to play with the settings. They're probably not perfect, but I just did it to uh, have it so that they wouldn't get stuck on walls and also that the um, uh, they can kind of come over here and kill the character. They can like come through here. They would get stuck all around here and they couldn't get to you, but now they can come in and find you. If you're in this little shelf area so um, yeah that was the major changes another thing that we did is uh, there's a cutscene I've also added this thing which is uh, the hand info station and if we go in here we have this hand and all this really does is just tell us what current level we're on we're gonna have five levels of enemies so it's just gonna display like one two three four and five and then every time the level changes, there's going to be like a tone that emits from the hand saying like uh, the level has changed or whatever. We also hung the guns up on the wall. All it is is just an area. And uh, when you enter the area, if you have the amount of money and you press the E button, we can buy that gun off the wall and then it gets added to the dictionary on our player. And if we go back up to the wall after we have... Uh, um, like we bought it and then we go back and we already have it in inventory it's gonna buy ammo for that gun just like in uh, zombies so we come over here uh, I think I put the wrong gun up twice I need to put the Mac 10 up but then I have the statue which doesn't do anything it's just there for the cutscene um, that I made 
and we can keep going. Uh, that's pretty much it that I've added. Um, textures are all changed. I added a shader from Godot Shaders. Uh, um, I think it's GodotShaders.net or whatever. I'll have a link in the description, but they have a bunch of free shaders you can use and you just gotta copy and paste them. Um, these torches, uh, I think we made them in Blender and then I just added those particles to them. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have like a little Easter egg whereas if you shoot all these bugs, it'll play a song. Um, and then I added some, uh, you know, just shit like that. This is actually gonna revolve around and those images are gonna change out. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, let me just go ahead and play it now and you'll see what the game looks like. We don't have an ending yet. We only have the um, five levels. Smoke him if you got him. So it's probably pretty loud. I might not do a whole lot of talking. The hand declares that it's level one. Ouch. So we start off with just this pistol and uh, we can shoot them. And if we shoot them in the eyes, uh, we do extra damage and we get rid of blood. Whereas if we shoot them just in the face, there's gold blood, and it does more damage too. So if we shoot them in the eye, it should kill them instantly. Yes, dude. And, uh, yeah. We probably could make the weapons a little bit better and make them kind of shoot where they're aiming, but yes, dude. more for demonstration than anything else. So you can kill them. Yes, dude. He's trying to get him to buy the shotgun. Yes, dude. Yes, dude. So you still get stuck on some stuff, but it's really not as bad. Especially once you shoot them, they have that little backup, so they usually unstick themselves, so it, I mean, yes, you know, for what it is, I'm okay with it. So, can we buy it? The hand declares it is level 2. So I can't buy the shotgun, I must have forgotten to code that one yet. But we can buy this clock. Ouch. Ouch. Oh, yes, dude. Maybe. Slow, but not. Okay, yeah, we can't do that. So, let's, uh... Ouch. And then anyway, when we die, we get this. All is well, you were eaten alive. And uh, yeah, and I'll just show you the beginning intro. I was the maintenance guy at the occult space museum. It was just me when a package appeared. I opened it and a statue flew out of the package, landing on the ritual altar inside the museum. At first, I thought my years of substance abuse had finally caught up to me, snapping my final tether on reality. But in actuality, an artifact had a mind of its own. Landing on the slate, it completed an ancient alien ritual, allowing unspeakable horrors into this world. The artifact communicated with me psychically. It said, pass the five trials and receive our blessing. I had two hours left in my shift, and I was almost completely sober. I decided I'd have to handle it. The management would flip shit if any of the new guys set off a space curse on his first day. Smoke him if you got him. Alright, and then we just come back to here. So, for the most part, this is the end of the tutorial. 
Um, if you've stuck around, we've done like UI, we've done some weapons, we've done player movement, we've created an enemy from scratch in Blender. There are some things that I did end up adding to the game uh, just for my own amusement. Uh, I added a boss fight, and uh, that is with, um, let's see if we can even find him. Um, yeah. So it's this guy here. He has a few attacks. He can either summon people or... Um, uh, he can summon more of those monsters to come and attack you that we made earlier, or he can spit like three little bolts of acid at you. Uh, the way I made him is by using this program called uh, Make Human. Might take a second to load. But yeah, this is a free program. Uh, just You can get Make Human Community, and it's from a website. You can download it and it will make meshes for you so you just select like you know gender male uh, male female you can choose the age um, you can do muscle weight height shit like that so um, yeah geometries you can add t-shirts uh, materials you can add faces so uh, all i did was just add, make a really weird face and then in blender i cut off his legs because you can file, uh, if you go to file here and you go to export, um, you can export it as an FBX and then you can actually upload that to uh, Mixamo if you want free animations or you can um, just bring it into Blender and make your own animations. You can even add a skeleton here. Uh, let's take a look. Where is it? Pose animate, uh, yeah, game engine skeleton. Um, default no toes so yeah I sometimes use the game engine skeleton here uh, I think it works all right if you just make it like simple little things so I like this program I use it all the time to make simple human models it makes it way faster and plus you can add like teeth and eyes and stuff and that's just hard to make in blender so you might as well automate some of your processes yeah so uh anyway that's the boss fight um i'm going to upload this entire godot project to my itch and uh you can download that and then you'll have all these things to parse through so you can see how i coded everything um yeah uh thanks for watching uh if this helped you out please subscribe um uh probably more to come have a good one